Sure. So first, um, happy Mother's Day to our um, our Latina mothers out there. So today technically is um, Mother's Day for them, or um, if you're celebrating it on Sunday, um, I hope that you have a great Mother's Day. I've been fortunate in my life to have a fantastic mom, and I try to emulate that and be the same um, good mother for my child. Um, so thank you for everybody who's done their job. Um, so the series of celebrations has begun. Um, we had our CEO of Biliteracy event. Um, today we had our art and music exhibit on Monday, or excuse me, this coming Friday, we're doing our college signing day, which is, which is recognizing not only two, four year, but also uh, military and trades. Um, so we're having that signing day we have about 150 students that are going to be coming out to the wellness center um, to celebrate with us and then we have innovator of the year on Monday the 15th um, where we recognize a whole series of certificated and classified employees and then 10 of those employees are going to be employees of the year and um, receive $250. And so no one knows who they are except for the foundation at this point. And um, so we will have a great um, time on Monday. So we hope that everyone can come out on Monday and support all the staff and the important work that they do. Um, and have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to our governing board comments and our report on uh, standing committee meetings. So this is our uh, opportunity for uh, each board member to make a few comments and we'll start with our student trustee, Muriel. Hello, good evening everyone. Uh, happy Mother's Day, Mother's Day as well. Um, I'm also very fortunate to have a very caring and thoughtful mother and it was really nice just driving around today around town and seeing all the flower vendors and like everyone carrying some bouquets that was really sweet um, and also just one more quick thing for me uh, so as we're nearing the end of the school year and approaching the next uh, we are currently seeking out the next student who will take my place as a student trustee and so if you're listening and know of any one of our many competent and passionate students who might be interested, please tell them to reach out to their principal and get more information that way. So, and I'm looking forward to meet them. The interviews are next week. So yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you. Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you. Um, Marielle, you've been an excellent, one of the best um, student reps we've ever had. So thank you for your participation and your very articulate and eloquent um, commentary on everything going on here at the district. We really appreciate you and we wish you well at Cornell next year. Very excited for you. Um, yay. Um, in the past two weeks, I've been, I, um, Jen Holm and I actually attended the Aptos Sports Foundation um, golf tournament dinner. I don't know if you went to the golf tournament, Jen, but. Briefly. <laughs> But we want to thank our friends at the Aptos Sports Foundation, in particular Paul Bailey, who heads that group, and um, all of the volunteers um, who make that happen, who raise, I think, more than $50,000 on behalf of Aptos High and surrounding schools. So thank you, Paul, very, very much. Um, the next night I attended the Aptos Hall of Fame uh, sports induction, and our very own Joseph Smith was inducted as, in the Hall of Fame um, for his work as a basketball coach, and we're really proud of him and thank him for all those years. His dad was also a Hall of Famer um, coach, and so um, the legacy lives on, so thank you very much. Um, Trustee Soto. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending and watching. Yeah, I also want to extend a Happy Mother's Day to all those mothers out there. You know, mine's been gone for a few years now, so if you still have yours and she's around, give her a big hug and tell her you love her. Thank you. Trustee Scout. Yes, Happy Mother's Day to the entire PVUSD community and everybody watching our meeting. I know so many of you watch these meetings, and it's wonderful to hear from you and get your feedback uh, about the important items we're working on. Also want to congratulate our student trustee for her success, and it's been great to get to know you a little bit, and Cornell's a great school. I know you're going to be great there. 
Um, and also, uh, we're getting into budget season, and there's going to be some important meetings coming up, or we're going to be, as a board, deliberating about uh, how to spend, what to spend, what to invest on, and it's a great time to get feedback from the entire community as to as to how we can uh, improve and ensure we're investing in our students properly. So I'm looking forward to, th to those conversations later tonight and in the coming weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Trustee Flores? Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. Feliz Dia de los Martes a todos los moms out there. Um, I want to let you know that I was able to go to the Principals Awards last night at Watsonville High School. Um, that was a really great time to see all the um, kids getting their awards from freshmen all the way to seniors. And our very own Moriel received two certificates. Congratulations. Um, I also was able to attend the LCAD meeting at PV High. Um, that was very interesting. I was able to listen to some concerns and, and see, you know, uh, some great input. And um, I would like to see, you know, more parents coming out and try to see how they can help support our schools. And so I encourage you to try to um, reach out with that survey. I'm not sure if it's still available, but if it is, please, I'm, I'm sure parents, you've received that survey in the mail. If you can fill that out, that would be great. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for being here this evening. Um, I have not, um, other than agenda setting committee, had any um, regular committee meetings. Um, up and coming will be the district safety committee meeting on May 17th. Um, which um, still has vacancies by two seats from board members. So I'd like to encourage any board member who's interested in taking up one of those seats to take that up. I th we meet quarterly. Um, and then the next one will be Intergovernmental Relations Committee meeting um, with our collaboration with the City of Watsonville and the County of Santa Cruz and hopefully to be inclusive of also Monterey County. Um, which will be on June 15th and we um, do still currently have a vacancy of one board member on that so if anyone's interested please um, reach out to President Holm and let her know of your request to maybe sit on one of those seats um, I, I, I do have one um, concerning um, thing that I, I, I just wanted to bring forward th um, that happened at the last board meeting um, at the end of the vote um, with regards to the cabinet salaries there there were some racist and threatening comments made from the public towards directed towards one dissenting board member and I do believe that I'm not the only board member that heard that based on expressions of other board members at that time um, I would just really like to implore that um, we be respective of that and uphold a certain decorum that that sort of tolerance of things such as that is just totally unallowable at any board meeting. Um, and sorry to have to bring that up, but a point of reference on that. But um, on top of that, I'd like to wish a happy Mother's Day again to all the mothers of our community. And I wish you a very happy Mother's Day both today and both on Sunday, which, other, which either day you observe that on. So thank you. Thank you. So it has been a very busy couple of weeks. Um, so I also attended the Aptos uh, Sports Foundation. Uh, I attended the, the very beginning of the golf tournament where our own Aptos High School principal you know, fired off the, the starting pistol to send off all the golfers and then the dinner. Um, and it was really, what was really special about the event was that it was, it was great to see so many community members and um, Aptos High alumni coming out to support our schools and our sports programs. And um, just, it was a great community event. Um, I also attended the benefits committee. Uh, presentations, there were presentations of tools that PVSD employees could use to choose the healthcare plan that works best for them and their family. And, you know, even as a healthcare worker myself and working in the industry for the past 18 years, I am just reminded of the complexities of navigating the United States healthcare system. I'll leave it at that. Um, and the Pajaro Valley Education Foundation, and I'm getting so excited for our uh, Innovator of the Year award ceremony on Monday at the Mellow Center. Um, it's gonna be a great event. 
I also attended the Seal of Biliteracy event. Um, our students, they're, they're amazing. Um, and, and just all of the students who have demonstrated proficiency in more than one language, and just how remarkable that is, and just what an achievement it is. It just, I just, it was a wonderful event. I attended the Santa Cruz Arts Council meeting this morning. Particular highlights were um, mention of the 12 total family arts nights throughout you know, our county and you know, through three different school districts. But particularly near and dear to my heart were the three they mentioned that were at our wellness center. And I'm just so pleased that our wellness centers are becoming sites for integrated whole person wellness that includes the arts. And that is just such a critical part of what wellness is, and I'm glad that that is part of it. Finally, um, I attended the art and music uh, exhibit uh, right before this meeting, and I encourage everyone to take a moment to, you know, view the amazing artwork that you know adorns the halls in this very building. It is, it is stunning. It is just beautiful. So you know, as 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 you were, if I know probably your cars are that way. But if you just take a brief detour that way for just a few minutes, it's it's worth the worth the time. That's it. Thank you. All right. Um, so we will move on to our high school students, uh, the board representatives report, and we'll start with uh, Pajaro Valley High School. Good evening, President de Serpa, Dr. Rodriguez, and board members. My name is Estefania. I'm the senior class president for PB High, and I'll be reporting for tonight. Since the last time we've met, our Grizzlies have had a Valentine's Day theme rally with music subcategories such as Taylor Swift, Selena, Bruno Mars, and Rihanna. They had fun games between students and teachers, as well as dance performances by our K-pop club, Cheer Squad, and Flor Florico Club. The week following up to our rally, we also had our Love is in the Air Spirit Week. We did Valentine's versus Anti-Valentine's on Tuesday, Fandom Day on Wednesday, Dress Your Type on Thursday, and Rally Shirts for Friday. That same day, our Dream Club hosted its annual Gran Baile, where they had a DJ as well as banda music. There were even fruit cups, aguas frescas, and Jerry's tacos offered to our students. Due to the recent tragedies in the Pajaro community, PV High has decided to start collecting monetary donations for students who've been affected by the recent storms. In an hour, we managed to fundraise $400. We've also been collecting basic necessities such as feminine hygiene products, diapers, and hygienic products for Pajaro residents, along with donations of clothes and art supplies. To kick off the month of March, our students decided to have a dodgeball tournament in the gym and a kickball tournament for March. There was a dodgeball game for seniors against freshmen on March 20th, a game for sophomores against juniors on March 21st, and two follow-up games for winners of the both previous games. On April 11th, ASB hosted a senior night out where students had the chance to go to Santa Cruz Roller and enjoy a night out with their friends. We would like to thank Taco, Jerry's Tacos for coming to this event. On April 14th, some of our leadership students decided to host a senior egg hunt in which they set up three different starting points to run to the end of the football field where there were many cool prizes awaiting them. For example, there were Lego sets, Polaroid cameras, surfboards, plushies, scooters, Nerf guns, and much more. (coughs) 
With the goal of supporting our clubs on campus and raising more money for them, our students held multiple club carnivals this semester. For the most recent one, which was on April 13, some of our students sold pizza, mangoneadas, cake pops, cookies, esquites, candy apples, and more. With many concerns expressed about the cost for prom, we decided to have a prom attire giveaway for our seniors and junior Grizzlies. We took them to a clothing shop in San Jose where they were able to pick out whatever accessories, shoes, and makeup they liked, as well as the clothes, of course. Um, on April 21st, leadership celebrated the birthday of our favorite twins, Catherine and Lauren Burke. Happy birthday again, and shout out to Claudia Monjaras for raising two great kids. On April 28th, we held our annual Powder Puff game. For those of you who don't know, this is basically a game where girls play football while boys are their cheerleaders and the whole school watches the game. This year, our seniors took the victory and won the Grizzly Bedazzled Cup football. Additionally, our seniors had their prom on May 6th in Monterey. The theme was Starry Night, there was delicious food, great music, and two photo booths. I think it's safe to say that our seniors had a blast. From February 8th to February 14th, our cheer, soccer, and basketball boys and girls athletes had their senior nights to recognize their hard work over the season. They were celebrated with posters and goodie bags along with a walk with their family and friends to honor them before their games. We would like to congratulate our boys soccer team for being the Cypress League champions, making it to the CCS championships and coming to second place. We would also like to recognize the player of the year for Cypress division, Isaac Rojas, the first team all league students, Aaron Hernandez, Ignacio Aguado, Isaac Rojas, and Joan Vasquez. For the second team all league students, we would like to recognize Giovanni Bedoya, Jesus Alvarado, Carlos Mata, and Juan Limon. For Richard Chamberlain All Sportsmanship Team, we would like to recognize Johan Vasquez. We are so proud of you guys and wish you guys the best luck for next year's season. As of now, the most important event that's coming up is graduation, which will be on May 31st. Our seniors will continue to prepare for this for the rest of the month. Thank you for listening and have a great night. Thank you, Stephanie. Next up, we have Virtual Academy. Good evening, PBUSC Board of Education, Dr. Rodriguez, Assistant Superintendent. My name is Ebony Farfan, and I am a senior at Virtual Academy. What I like most about Virtual Academy is I am able to move at my own pace, and if I have any troubles, I could easily reach out to my teacher. Every week is a busy week for all students at VA with opportunities for enrichment learning and extracurricular activities. On a weekly basis, students can participate in virtual field trips, leadership club, coding club, or book club, as well as attend tutoring hours for extra support. In addition to our coursework, we are celebrating and studying Asian American and Pacific Islanders Heroes Month for the month of May in our weekly meetings when reviewing the weekly newsletter with our supervising teacher. VA students are wrapping up state and district testing this month. Grades 6 to 10 are participating in spring NWA MAP testing this week. 100% of seniors completed the SBAC California Science Test. 96% of 11th grade students have completed the Math CA, EOLA CA, and EOLA PT and MAP PT. For LPAC testing, 100% of high school students have completed the listening, reading, and writing test. The speaking test is still being administered. Ninth grade students begin the PFT, physical fitness testing, this week. Lastly, AP exams are concluding this week. The Leadership Club has been working with Ms. Candelaria, Ms. Manier, and Mr. Bielenberg to present a digital yearbook where students can share the shine, including a photo or a video of a school project, interest, hobby, etc. Their all school assembly will be held on May 26 at 10 a.m. 
VA's Coding Club has been busy working on computer programming projects related to the core course curriculum, such as Challenge, Exploring the Sun, in addition to creating interactive video games like My Drone Game and Speedball Racing. VA's book club has read and discussed the following novels this school year. The books were selected from a pre-approved age-appropriate list and include male and female protagonists. Current social issues and are inclusive of VA students' cultures and family traditions. Thank you for listening to this presentation. Wonderful, thank you. Next up, we have Watsonville High School. Rodriguez, President Home and Board of Trustees. My name is Sandra Medel, Senior Class President. My name is Selena Salvador, ASB Co-President. So starting with prom, prom this year was April 15th. Um, we included banda, DJ, um, a fancy dinner, a taco truck, and about 510 um, people attended prom, 480 students. Um, it was located at the General Stillwell Community Center in Seaside. May is a Asian American Pacific Islander Month, and in partners with our Watsonville High School AAPI Union Club, we will be having staff spotlights, infographics, and celebra celebratory events post around school. So last week was um, Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, we made some goodie bags for the teachers, um, and we, we would call it the socket to you, um, to your favorite teacher, um, which every teacher got one. Um, and as you can see, they loved it. <laughs> so last week on Wednesday, we had a Roar Redemption where our students who earned points through our Five Star app received fun prizes incentives for, um, except for showing Roar, which is responsibility, optimism, acceptance, and respect around campus. Um, so last week, we had a spirit day called May the 4th Be With You. Um, so basically, you would wear anything related to Star Wars, and you would get a candy and a sticker for participating. So for we just finished our SBAC testing for our juniors and seniors, as well as we are about to finish our a AP exams um, from starting last week to this week. And yesterday was our Principals Awards, where we celebrated all Wildcats, had lots of cake, um, and had Willie the Wildcat as a special guest. And Friday this week will be our Commitment Day, celebrating our seniors for their future. Um, also, this month, we celebrated our volley boys volleyball, boys baseball, and tomorrow we will be celebrating our girls softball teams. As through their senior night ceremony where we celebrate all their seniors for their hard work put into the athletic programs. Um, and also last week we had um, a celebration of Cinco de Mayo. We had a food day sale. Um, 10 plus clubs um, joined us to, by, to support, participate um, and we had live music. June 1st is Watsonville High School's graduation, so we will be having grad tryouts tomorrow, I mean, um, next week, tomorrow, for anyone our senior, of our seniors who want to say a small speech, sing a song, read a poem, anything they'd like. Okay, so next week we're having the Senior Spare Week. Um, so it's going to be from the 15th through the 29th, through the 19th, I mean. Um, so basically on Monday, you would wear anything but a backpack day. On Tuesday would be wear your college or cats um, merch. Wednesday would be um, dress as a senior citizen. Thursday, dress like your favorite staff. And Friday, ready for summer. Okay. So Powder Puff is a flag football event for our seniors and juniors where they go against each other. <laughs> 
Um, and we have our seniors who will be wearing pink and juniors who will be wearing white. The game is May 18th, next week on Thursday. So Friday of next week, the 19th, we will also be having our Kiss the Senior Goodbye Rally where we decorate all the whole gym with Kiss cutouts with our all our senior names posted around where we will be having games and music, a special video showing, which is our Kiss the Senior Goodbye where we have lots of all of our memories from senior year and past years all in one. And we will be sending off our seniors with love. So Senior Sunset will be on Wednesday the 24th um, at Gazer Fields uh, from 6 to 9 p.m. We're also going to be playing a movie, and we're going to have games, a movie, food, and more stuff. So, For our seniors, we will be having our grad night at the boardwalk that will include lots of food, a $20 food cart, actually, with open available rights just for us, and with a limited munchies and sodas and water. Thank you, and happy, happy Mother's, Day Mother's Day to all mothers. Thank you. Thank you to all our students. All right. Um, so moving on to approval of the agenda, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda, um, but just with a note of um, something that I noticed and was brought to my attention, that when the agenda was initially published on um, Friday the 5th, um, that there had been some slight changes to some action items. I mean, nothing within the content really, but just some structural changes. And so I'd just like to caution us against doing that for um, in the future going forward. Um, with the agenda so but I will make a motion to approve the tonight's agenda with that note to that I have a first do I have a second all those in favor aye, aye. any aye. opposed motion carries 601 all right moving on to approval of the minutes um approval of the march 30th 2023 uh Parho middle school resolution special board meeting minutes can i have a motion i have a first from trustee flores second from trustee soto all those in favor aye any opposed motion carries six zero one Approval of the March 30th, 2023 Administrative Salaries Review Special Board Meeting Minutes. Can I have a motion? Can I have a second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. And can I have a motion for approval of the April 19th, 2023 Student Recognition Special Board Meeting Minutes? All right. Um, that first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 601. And finally, approval of the April 26, 2023 regular board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? I have a first, do I have a second? I have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. All right, moving on to our uh, visitor non-agenda items, uh, public comment. So this is our opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for this evening. And just as a reminder, which I say every time, um, that although the Brown Act doesn't permit us to engage in discussion back and forth on these comments, please know that we are listening. Um, do we have any public comments? Yes, we do. We have seven, and I will call you up by three. And if I mispronounce your name, please do feel free to correct me. Um, I do appreciate that. Christina Carter, Brian Saxton, and Tara Mickle. Good evening. Thanks for letting me speak. I'm Christina Carter. I am a teacher at Minty White School. Uh, on behalf of the teachers at Minty White, we'd like to thank you first for your commitment to the students and teachers of our 
uh, of this district and our recent settlement for, for salary benefits and contract language. Thank you very much. We all are very appreciative. Um, next, my ma main reason to speak with you tonight is um, to speak to our concerns about VAPA PE and impending music program for the 2023 20, school year and beyond. Our full-time VAPA and PE teachers have been at Minty White for a combined 25 years, and they have continued to develop and fine-tune their stellar programs over time. Students are very engaged and motivated and look forward to their time with these specialty teachers every week. For some of our students, it is the reason they come to school. For others, it is the one time they are successful at school. Listen to some of the direct quotes from students. I love that she teaches us new words about art. I learned to make a stop motion movie and characters out of clay. I love painting because I can see the colors change. I like watercoloring. She taught me to draw. I like making the ocean and a fox and flowers. I like playing cooperative games. I learned organized games. I like sports and com competitions. We got to use different PE equipment and exercise with a pacer and music. Classroom teachers are extremely grateful for the continuity of these programs and the positive developmental, academic, social, and emotional impact they have on our students. Just look at the art around our building tonight. Um, but now we're getting vague messages about changes for next year, in VAPA especially. Save the Music is coming. Supposedly, PVUSD will be bringing hiring teachers to provide music to all students next year. We teachers support this, but not at the expense of our already excellent programs. Is that my time? Okay, that's my time. We're very concerned. I also, the letter has been sent Thank you. with more detail, and these are also comments from students. Uh, here's a copy of the letter also. All the cabinet has the letter as, as well. Thank you. Good evening, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, board members. My name is Brian Saxon. I'm the director of HR for Certificated. So I just wanted to highlight the PVUSD Certificated Classified Job Fair that we held last week on 5-6, uh, this last Saturday. Uh, this was our second job fair this year, and we had over 100 job seekers come out from 10 to 12 uh, p.m. We also had Dr. Rodriguez and Casey come out. I don't think they were looking for jobs, but they were there. So I want to thank our HR staff for setting up and running this fair. Additionally, we had a large number of different departments come. Uh, we had secondary administration, migrant seasonal head start, uh, elementary admin, special ed, VAPA, ECE, and adult ed. Uh, this illustrates that hiring staff is a joint effort and shows how PVUSD lifts each other up. Uh, just in those two hours, we hired five certificated staff. One behavior tech set up interviews for a number of classified candidates, and additionally, we offered interviews to a number of our student teachers who are currently working in our classrooms. So we're, we were very excited about that. And our next job fair, if you are looking for a job to be a teacher is or classified staff, is June 10th. Thank you. Good evening. I'm here today as an elementary science teacher, a talent show committee member, a lover of music, art, and dance. I'm here to express my concerns with the new Save the Music grant. Starlight Elementary, where I teach, has long had a talent show for students to demonstrate their talents. And as a committee member, I'm always excited when a student brings an instrument to play as a talent. This is un unfortunately extremely rare. So I was very excited to learn that the district was moving toward music education to our students in elementary. However, I am troubled as I have learned more about how the grant may affect the overall education that our students receive in the arts and beyond. First, the grant requires that students at all grade levels receive at least 45 minutes of music class each week. This is a great way for students to gradually progress in their music skills. However, it is the music, if the music teacher is also a release teacher and requires, required to give prep time to the other teachers, um, that is going to have an effect on those current release teachers and their students. Essentially, this would mean less 
direct science instruction from me as a science teacher at fourth and fifth grade from our science specialist teachers. And sadly, that also means less dance and less visual art instruction from our skilled and qualified VAPA teachers. The art program that as at Starlight has a huge strength and the teacher that teaches there is an artist herself. And the dance teacher that we've had, and they split some of the prep time, have created a really wonderful commitment to fine arts at our school. And they're being asked now to s move from our school and separate into having to do two schools and learn many more students and, and many more things. Um, I encourage you to really look closely at whether this is the best way to do it as, re as a release position. Thank you. Thank you. Our next three speakers um, are Rachel Hitchcock, Lucia Herrera, and Marilyn Garrett. Hello, Dr. Rodriguez, Executive Cabinet, and the Board. My name is Rachel Hitchcock. I am the 4-5 science teacher at MSD, a position I've held and immensely enjoyed since 2001. I'm here tonight to ask you to reconsider phasing out elementary visual and performing art teachers. Why can't students have music, visual, and performing art teachers? Dr. Rodriguez, recently in your top 10 questions, you stated that gen ed teachers can teach art more easily than music. But gen ed teachers are already overloaded and art will simply be crafts that teachers manage to fit in for the holidays. There are art standards and students receive art grades. Art teachers do more than simply provide release time. They are part of our school community and work hard to provide engaging and meaningful instruction, as well as build crucial relationships with students and their families. It is also my understanding that instead of science teachers providing release time to fourth and fifth grade teachers, the district would like science teachers and music teachers together to provide their release minutes to all TK through fifth grade classes. Meaning, I would now teach less science to more students. I would teach over 400 students a week. Here is a box that represents the size of a bin of materials from our new science curriculum that we are adopting next year. Each unit comes with one to two bins of materials this size for each class in every grade. There are 19 classes at MSD, so this is a minimum of 19 bins. But there are three or four units in each grade, so this is a minimum of 57 bins of materials. This curriculum is costing the district over $2 million, yet the plan is to reduce the amount of time that I teach science. This makes no sense because I will not be able to effectively teach using these materials in just one hour a week. I am an incredible science teacher, not only because I have a single subject science credential and continuously work extremely hard with the Monterey Bay Aquarium and other institutions to grow as a teacher, but I was also a second and third grade teacher. Thank you. Even with all my years of experience, I would never teach you. K through five science. It's madness. Good evening. My name is Lucia Herrera. I'm a visual art uh, teacher. I'm a passionate about my work, and I'm deeply rooted in my school, Amesti. I truly believe that split um, sites will be will be waken the visual arts program, as the teachers will have larger students load, which can result in decreased time and quality of our uh, our lessons. Our personal lives are also very much affected as we have set everything around at the location of our schools. In my case, for example, my son is picked up and dropped off at a MESTI, and this will not be possible at another site. Please give us the opportunity to transform and integrate visual arts and music to those teachers willing to do that and not move us from our current sites. The goal of Save the Music is to train general ed teachers to teach music. So please give us the opportunity to be trained and to integrate both 
music and visual arts. Thank you very much for your consideration and your time. Marilyn Garrett, retired teacher from the school district. I consider myself a public health advocate, an advocate for the well-being of children. And I am just a messenger of the facts of the problems with pesticides, radiation, the cell phones, the Wi-Fi, et cetera. And um, you have been provided data over the years of the harm. And uh, nothing is done to correct it. It's very disturbing. I also find many teachers People do not want to look at the literature that I am giving them, so they have another source of information. And I'm thinking how, when we're told to just believe the authorities, like so, Dr. Fauci, I want to recommend a book. Dr. Fauci, Bill Gates, Big Pharma, and the Global War on Democracy and Public Health by Robert F. Kennedy Jr., extremely well-documented book, and he's just announced he's running for president on the Democratic ticket. When I read that book and other books, what we're told our authorities are usually working for pharmaceutical corporations, big corporations. I was brought up to question authority and to critique things, evaluate, question. That's what education should be about and what democracy should be about. And when I see people not doing that, it's very disturbing. Thank you. I'm going to leave you with a card on the desk from the HP. Thank you. That was too many. V learn the risk dot org. Thank you. These are dangerous. Thank you. You want me to change that? Sure. Did you want to speak on six point one as well? And you, so, so you want 6.1, 7.1, you just misnoted. No, he's going to put it up. Two. Oh, 7.3. I got that. Never mind. I'll change to 6.1 for you, Chris. Thank you. Okay, so our next two speakers are Chris Webb and Marta Belayich. Uh, good evening. Um, I also want to express my appreciation for the, the uh, approved uh, compensation increase for, for all the employee groups. Um, also, um, as a teacher at Renaissance, it was recently brought to our attention that there was a proposal for changes for our site. Um, this proposal was put forward to cabinet before any of the teachers had any chance to consider it. And um, in learning about it, I've had some, some troubling, some things trouble me about it. Um, just like one thing is that I feel like we're, we haven't acknowledged that like last year, the having, having things put down to us, top down planning, um, and not really including stakeholders it has not really been working out that well. And I feel like this is kind of continuing that. Um, a couple of specific concerns I have with it are that we're like Renaissance is like a safety net for the school. And it seems like we're trying to have uniformity across the school a district. And this means replicating some of the holes that our students already fell through that Renaissance caught them in. Like we're catching students, but now if we redo everything the way the comprehensives do, then there there's there is no catching them. So I'm talking about like for example going from variable credits to um, to grades, and I feel like another part of the problem with that is that it reduces meritocracy because right now for everything you you do you're you're being honored with a, a commensurate uh, credit earnings. But if we go to grades, then there might be more credit inflation, because not every student, most students don't earn the full five. Yet if we do this, pass fail only, some will get, there's gonna be some inflation. And then there's gonna be other students who um, 
like basically they're not we're going to raise the standards but then we're not going to have the same supports that we historically have so i think that's um a cause for concern and i think we should rethink that thank you Members of the board, my name is Marta Balayich. On February 28th, the Watsonville City Council, through a defective legislative procedure, approved a zoning amendment and use permit for Saba Charter School to allow the school to operate in the industrial zone permanently. Part of the justification that City Council used in approving the project was the imposition of a number of use permit conditions of approval that ostensibly served to mitigate the injurious impact of the school on adjacent uses. Since that time, Saba has been openly violating those conditions of approval. Saba is currently using a procedure of having school buses drop off and pick up students in an industrial beer distributor's parking lot. This is done in a reckless and negligent, ma negligent manner, and then they route the students over to a driveway that abuts the Riverside Drive, Highway 129, all the while exposing children to large advertising, ad advertising graphics of beer and alcohol. These procedural violations resulted in a formal complaint filed with the Watsonville City Government. Additionally, Saba lacks adequate parking on site. Prior to the City Council approval, Saba school principal Josh Ripp and Saba representatives indicated that Saba had acquired parking spaces from the adjacent beer distributor facility, thereby extending school operations to a beer distributor lot. To the best of my knowledge, there has not been any zoning approval to allow this. Given that the Paro Valley Unified School District is the co lessee of Saba's building next to a beer distributor lot, and that the board is the authorizer for Saba and has oversight authority, the board members should make note of the situation as they monitor Saba's behavior, integrity, and ongoing lack of concern for student safety and well being. Thank you. Here's a copy of the formal complaint. Are there any other public speakers? That is the last of our public speakers. Thank you. We will move on to our employee organizations. And so now we get to hear from our employee organizations. Each will have five minutes. And we'll start with Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Good evening, board. Cabinet, Dr. Rodriguez, um, quiero comenzar diciendo feliz día de las madres a todas las mujeres cari cariñosas, um, porque todas las mujeres merecen este día. Um, I want to personally thank you, board, for approving the agreements we reached with PVUSD in, at the April 26th board meeting, and to Roddy for representing the PVFT that night, while a fellow teacher and I lobbied legislators to support public funding and education at the Capitol that day. Education is important, and I believe that we can all agree with that statement. Funding education is where sentiments begin to come out, and how a district prioritizing, prioritizes its budgeting of public tax dollars speaks volumes, especially when the funding of public education is limited. One can resort to creating an air of suspension of disbelief. That's a theater term if you're not familiar with it. So a suspension of disbelief for the community with catchy hashtags like fill your cup, together we lift up, all in. But a lack of solid system of supports will reveal the truth. Sometimes that revelation is not soon enough, or it's too late, rather. While we celebrate the increase of our salaries, we also bargain over important language, or we also bargained over important language that is centered on how we improve the workload and working conditions of the people we represent but ultimately it benefits our students because creating safe and sustainable learning spaces for our students is not lost on us. It is teachers and practitioners who sit on our bargaining team after all. So when we see language that we bargain for being misrepresented or flat out ignored, we will grieve it. When we see a programmatic change that impacts workload, we will bargain those impacts. As a union, we advocate for the funding and improvements to public education, such as last year's Proposition 28 funding for the arts and music education in schools. According to a September 23rd Pahadonian article, Clint Rucker, our CBO, stated that our district is looking at an additional $2 million if that were to pass, because that was before it was voted on. So that's 
just so you guys know, you all know, because I don't know how much you delve into the specifics of um, how funding works or is um, generated here in our district. This funding for the arts is an additional to what we normally get for LCFF. And yet, the arts and the opportunities for the arts are being narrowed for our elementary students. So you're gonna see this wonderful presentation. It's pretty, pretty, pretty nice looking, I, I saw it, for the art and music teachers um, you know, uh, you know, to, to celebrate what our art and music teachers create and provide to our district um, for our students. But here's what we have learned. We've learned that the district plans to phase out performing arts and, el performing, um, and visual arts uh, in our elementary schools and only focus on maintaining music in elementary. This means that elementary music teachers will have upwards to 500 students, if not more, depending on the size of the school, who, will they, um, who they will be providing not only the lessons and the instruction for, but grades. Um, where's that time? We barely have time for all the things that we do already in, as teachers. So when we asked about this, because we learned about it, not long ago, only a couple weeks ago, and we immediately put in our demand to bargain, which we will be doing, but a decision has already been made. Are you aware of that? Is this what you, our board, who is responsible to the constituents in your area, are agreeing to? So the response that we received was that at least they're going to do this to all of our elementaries. So let's celebrate equity. Um, I'll speak to, I'm gonna come up and speak as just apart from PBFT when um, you see the PowerPoint, because it, it truly is um, lovely. It is, uh, the arts are important. Um, and because I know that my time is li limited here as the union representative, um, or all of our unions only have five minutes whenever we come to speak to you, to give you our updates. Um, and we don't have a discourse because According to the Brown Act, we don't respond, or you don't respond. But there are things that are happening that are taking place that you should be aware of. Part of that proposition actually gives the rights to how this um, program, the, the funding is um, divided, uh, is up to the school site. So something to look into. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to our? Yes, we do, and I have a clarifying question. I'm sorry, Chris, did you want to speak at 7.1 or 7.3? Three, okay. Then we have one public speaker um, for this, uh, Donna Lefevre. Hi, uh, my name is Donna Lefevre. Sorry, I'm a little turned around. End of the school year, very challenging. Lost my prep a couple times, so that makes class much more difficult. Um, <clears throat> I So I didn't see the email that said it was over here. I was over at the other place. So I was like, um, <clears throat> so I've been, we just had a department meeting today. Um, so I want to speak from my math teacher's perspective at Watsonville High School. Um, but also, my mom um, has their open house and I just want to speak from like the teacher professional perspective where we really want to make sure that our class experience and these big things like open house um, are really celebrating all of the things that the kids do in class and really trying to promote um, education as more than just test scores. But um, as a third grade teacher, um, the third graders have to experience so much testing and it just seems to really line up with um, the state test and then r just right after now we're map testing and then they have another test they have to give and so she's feeling like she's got only test scores and not a lot of time. So that was one thing that I wanted to just pitch from that, that end. Um, from the math teacher perspective at the high school level, 
uh, we're really struggling to make sure that our kids are getting access to good education in math because of the inflated class sizes, um, which we really need to work on getting smaller, um, and because there's no push-in support um, for students that have different kinds of uh, special needs that, that are coming into the classroom, there's no one pushing in to help them. They get some support outside, but it doesn't happen in the classroom, and that's where they're really needing the help. Um, so we need to find ways to make sure that we're not so understaffed at our sites. Um, and that needs to be, I mean, great for the raise, but like that we have a teacher leaving because they get paid more another place. So um, we really need to keep looking at how we're going to make sure the schools are fully staffed so the kids have good educational experiences. Um, they're getting the support that they need. And that means that paying more across the board in all the ways we can support. Um, so thinking about our instructional aids, yeah. thinking about our, how we get substitutes yeah. to the classroom, all of those things. Oh, we need to get them pay more. All right, moving on to um, CSEA, California School Employees Association. I am here on behalf of our chapter president who's not here, so I'm relaying his message. Don't kill the messenger, especially when I do this. <laughs> um, uh, good evening, Board of Trustees, Cabinet, and Michelle. Um, um, Richard said he just looks forward to negotiations and thankful for no layoffs and glad to see the district to be doing good financially. Um, I'd like to add um, thank you to all the teachers from last week. It was their week, but every day should be their day, as well as moms um, and moms in, in all aspects. Um, thank you for always the teachers always being there, you know, helping our children, not just them, their families and the community. Uh, we, you know, they educated my kids, they've educated all of our, our students and thank you very much. There's, you know, not enough thank yous are enough, but um, from the heart it is. And also, uh, happy Mother's Day, Feliz de las Madres for the moms that celebrate on May 10th and for those who will be celebrating on Sunday. Thank you. Public speakers for that one? Yeah. All right. Um, for our Pajaro Valley Association of Managers. Good evening, President Dr. Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, trustees, and assistant superintendents. I'm Peggy Pugh, Executive Director for Teaching and Learning, and I'm here tonight in representation of my colleagues from the Pajaro Valley Association of Managers. PAVAM is a group of classified and certificated managers. Each month, our members make a voluntary donation that funds a, funds a yearly scholarship for three high school students through a site-based selection process. We are excited to announce that our PAVAM has grown and has expanded threefold this month, thanks to the efforts of recruiting efforts of some of our managers. And that just means that we're going to be able to fund even more scholarship monies next year. So we're very excited about that. This year, PAVAM is proud to present the following three students with $300 each to support their college journey. We're pleased to honor these three students with scholarships, and we wish them all the very best in continuing their educational journey. Please join me in congratulating the 2023 PAVAM scholarship recipients. Jack Curran from Aptos High School. Ariana Ramirez Chavez from Pajaro Valley High School. And Chris Lopez from Watsonville High School. Thank you very much. And we have one public speaker, Chris Webb. Yes, um, I wanted to reflect on some of the some of the Pavam comments and, and some of their members who were commenting in, in the last two couple meetings. Um, so there was some some criticism towards others about requesting that uh, when we did the approvals um, that management and cabinet be separate and it was said that just asking for that was inherently divisive and i was thinking about that i'm like well all the other groups are already coming before this board in that way and really what was being asked for is basically the same treatment so that made me think like was that was were all the groups separated intentionally to divide i wouldn't have thought that before but hearing um, some of the commenters made me think well maybe it was 
And, and also, I, I, I also just want to appreciate the board because in between um, the 8th of March and April 22nd, uh, as a union rep, I got less cases of people complaining about um, basically trying to follow processes and then being, being like threatened in a way. So it, like basically just your one move with that, with that extra deliberations had like a, a good effect um, in terms of like treatment of teachers. Um, also, I reflecting with teacher friends in across districts. I'm talking about other other districts over the hill. Some of their big, and then also this one. Thinking about what happens when we change a principal or other upper management, and then like basically we were talking about how like well sometimes you make these changes, but still things don't necessarily change that much. And it made me think like well sometimes maybe I guess it's the system that needs more changing, and just changing out people is maybe not the answer. Um, also. Given that phenomenon, I feel like um, there should be a union for this group and that a path to, to uh, move up should be including one section of teaching. I feel like if, if managers have to teach one section, that would really um, improve things. Thank you. All right, do we have anyone from Communication Workers of America? Not tonight. All right, so we will move on to our report and discussion items, and we will have our, visual, our PVUSD visual and performing arts update, and our report will be presented by Stephanie Monroe, our coordinator for VAPA and GATE. Thank you. Good evening, President Holm, Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees and Cabinet. I'm Stephanie Monroe, the coordinator of K-12 Visual and Performing Arts and Gifted and Talented Education. And I'm honored to report on the wellness of the VAPA program at PVUSD. Am I? I can do it myself. Okay. Gotcha. This. This one? Okay. This. Mm, wrong button. <laughs> The arts are an essential element of education, just like reading, writing, and arithmetic. Music, dance, painting, and theater are all keys that unlock profound human understanding and accomplishment. It's a quote by uh, William Bennett, the former U.S. Secretary of Education. The PVUSD's mission in the arts department is to provide access to opportunities in arts education. We see the value of the arts as an integral part of the core curriculum. Sorry, I've got something ghosting right there. Um, and the culture of our schools. The key elements to our mission continue to be equity of access, high quality standards based content, cross curricular arts integration, social emotional learning, and community engagement. Tonight you'll have an opportunity to see highlights in arts education from this school year, including our celebrations, our sustaining and expanding programs, and what we're looking forward to in the future. I'm proud to share our program's updates, and um, as you most you know, I've just recently transitioned to my uh, role uh, just after winter break, and it's been a little bit like drinking from a wi uh, fire hose, but it is a testament to the great work of Sue Gralty, uh, our cabinet, and the vision of Dr. Rodriguez, who established uh, programs that are helping to build sustainable foundations for district programs um, across the art disciplines. I'll start with music. Um, there are strong music programs at um, middle and high school, and they're um, expanding and providing students opportunities for competition and statewide recognition. Additionally, students are building uh, collaboration and cooperation skills necessary to perform as an ensemble, and that's starting as early as elementary. Um, highlights from this year include the addition of three new Save the Music sites, um, Aptos High School students being selected for All State Choir, and our second annual um, district middle school honor band, uh, which pr they performed just earlier tonight, uh, and the youth orchestra through El Sistema in conjunction with the expanded learning program. This, uh, I'm going to show you a lot of pictures, but this is a, um, a picture of a very cooperative group, a very large but cooperative group of students performing or uh, rehearsing at Mar Vista Elementary uh, before winter break. These very attentive students at Ann Soldo are getting a lesson um, in rhythm from their teacher, Mr. Hara. 
This is Elsa, St Elsa Stemma at McQuitty with students performing for their families. And McQuitty students also performed uh, for several hundred audience members in Seaside in February at the Youth Ensemble Showcase under the direction of the exceptionally talented teacher, Ms. Mirren McPolin. Here you see uh, Ms. Holly Oda with her Aptos Junior High School students and high, uh, and high school choirs rehearsing uh, this past February ahead of their concert. And here we have students from across the district playing together in the very beautiful EA Hall Auditorium at our second annual Honor Band concert with guest conductor Dr. Jesse Leva. They also performed earlier tonight. Um, they spend a, a lot of extra time just you know on their own this is not part of a class uh, they they do this on their own time uh, to pursue their passions and their ta their talent is really evident and it's just a flyer and some more pictures there uh, this is uh, Mr. Finley Asmuth with his high school band at um, Aptos High School. Um, Mr. Asmuth teaches elementary, middle, and high school to ensure a pathway of opportunity for students wanting to learn band instruments, and he makes it very fun for them while they learn. Uh, these, uh, this is a performance at Watsonville High School and students practicing in sectionals and in band class with um, band uh, director Ms. Cristela Alfaro, who's new this year. Uh, students in drum corps are shown here. And um, I don't know what that is, but that's, I don't know. There, I think there was, I had a video, but we don't have enough time for it. But um, I had a video of our students in drum corps at a football game. Very fun to watch. Um, and um, students really having a good time with that. Um, oh, yeah, there it is. So I'm going to go past it, though. Um, our visual arts program. Um, is prospering as well. Among the um, many accomplishments this year are the pop-up shows in local cafes and the PVA's Porter Building, and um, the Watsonville Parks and Rec's approval of a pu public art project of student work, um, our annual Government Center District Art Show, which opened tonight, and our PV uh, PVSD participated in the County Youth Art Show, which um, just closed last week, and it was phenomenal. Um, lots and lots of beautiful, amazing pieces of artwork there. Um, this is a slide uh, from Bradley with uh, students um, learning visual art, and uh, it is a science integration um, lesson there. Um, here's a few more pictures. These are um, second grade, second and third graders here. Um, these are students taught in um, uh, Miss Brannon's class, Freeman, Brandon Freeman. Here's an image of CCMS students at their Dia de los Muertos display at PVA this year. Uh, students working on the CCMS mural. And students with works in progress here. These students are from Aptos Junior High building their uh, 3D ceramic pots based on their own designs. And this uh, is an example of a cross-curricular unit between art and ethnic studies developed by Rhea Hurt, our VAPA TOSA. These are examples of artworks from both Aptos and Watsonville High. Students wrote and created self-portraits with within the theme of identity. This culminated in an exhibition where students saw their work in a group show at the Porter Building in, in Watsonville. It was also just phenomenal. Um, Judy Stabil from uh, Pajaro Valley Art Center supported uh, the second iteration of the project to be installed as movable murals. So you'll see those going up soon. Um, the public exhibit has been approved by the city of Watsonville and is currently in the production phase. And of course, tonight's opening reception um, celebrates student artwork made in our district, and we hope you had the opportunity to uh, visit all the floors in this center to see the more than 400 original pieces of artwork. Very impressive. Um, this is just an image of um, for uh, Miguel Martinez Villalobos, who is um, a 12th grader at Watsonville High School. He's a first place winner in the county art exhibit. It's an amazing work of art, and this is under the direction of um, Sarah Webb at Watsonville High School. Um, I want to talk a little bit about dance. Um, dance is a discipline that has opportunities for expansion across our district and was showcased um, at several sites this year. But students have the opportunity to express themselves through movement, and students can learn about culture through dance. This gives students voice through movement. Um, here we see students at Lakeview Middle School performing a traditional folklorical dance that had a surprise ending. You might not be able to see it, but the um, girls had a candle on their head. They were LED, but they danced the whole time, and it, they never fell off, and they took them off at the end, so it was really fun to watch that. 
very creative. Um, the Lakeview students performed a regional dance that got the crowd really excited. Um, not only did they learn the choreography, but they also learned about the history and the origins of many different dance styles. Um, these students from PV High and their teacher, Mr. Gabriel Jones Robledo, performed a Mexican folklorical dance in these photos. And the, um, this is a visiting artist that performed last month um, at Lakeview Middle School during the after school program. And she, she and her troupe provided um, inspiration and cultural connections um, for many students. And they got to learn about various dance styles and interact with the artists as well. So it was a lot of fun. Theater. Um, our high schools uh, presented incredible plays this year, and um, these are always great opportunities to gain skills and confidence in many areas. Theater not only prepares students for opportunities in acting and stage production, but it allows them to develop confidence, public speaking skills, literacy, and language acquisition. Um, PV students performed at McQuitty. These are PV high students um, performing at McQuitty for their after school program. Very funny plays based on children's literature, and these are books that the students were reading. And it was extremely entertaining and engaging for the students, and the PV high students did a fantastic job. We've got a bunch of images from um, the Aptos High School Theater students. This is just the cast here. Um, this is on stage uh, with their performance of Head Over Hills, a historical play that had a modern twist. Music by the Go-Go's, really cool. Um, some additional images of them on stage here. And um, teacher Stacy Aronovici with the cast, and just does an amazing job. Um, in film, the Youth Cinema Project is going strong at two elementary, middle, and high schools, um, uh, reaching approximately 400 students in the district with opportunities to learn script writing and filmmaking. Um, we had a fantastic um, visit from Hollywood actor Pepe Serna. Um, the Youth Cinema Project you know, is a very hands-on approach to learning um, all stages of film, uh, writing, producing, um, filming, editing. And you see students here um, making a video of what the goings on in, in, this, um, in that image to the right um, during that visit. Um, here, uh, Pepe Cerno was uh, doing an improv workshop at, with students at PMS. And the students at CCMS are posing after having their session with uh, Pepe Cerna. And Dr. Rodriguez had an opportunity to give an interview with local media wanting to cover this very, very newsworthy event. Um, we have a lot of engagement with our uh, community and community partners. Um, we're fortunate to partner with El Sistema Youth Cinema Project, um, the County Office of Education for programs such as Fashion Teens and the County Art Show. Um, as I mentioned before, pa um, Pajaro Valley Arts, uh, Santa Cruz Arts Council, and Watsonville Film Festival. Um, here we have students who um, used um, found items at that for another purpose, a chance to be repurposed and upcycled in wearable art for the STEAM themed uh, fashion teens where the love of fashion and social environmental activism, activism merge. Here our students um, shared their designs in the annual countywide uh, program and students, uh, student based projects like these center on student vision, empowering them to develop their unique voices. Uh, thanks to our amazing filmmakers, audience, and sponsors, we had an incredible 11th uh, Watsonville Film Festival, and this uh, festival honored trailblazing actor, as I mentioned, um, Pepe Serna. Uh, later this month, we'll partner again with uh, Watsonville Film Festival to hold our Oscars on the 23rd, and that's an event where all the films created by our Youth Cinema Project students will be shown, and the students also have an opportunity to see their films screened in Hollywood at the annual La Leaf, that's the Los Angeles Latino International Film Festival. Um, more than 400 uh, uh, works of art uh, were created and held at or hung at the Santa Cruz County um, Government Building on Ocean Street, and that it was the one that ended on the 5th. But there are, I just heard, there are um, still lots of art work there, so if you have a chance to swing by and see it, I definitely recommend it. Um, these are just some images. It's, this is just a fraction of the artwork that um, is at the County Building there in Santa Cruz. And it was incredible to see the talent and hard work that went into bringing this show to life. So not only did we have um, 2D um, artwork, but there was also um, 3D, and you can see that in the top right, and that was fabulous. Um, these are images from our El Sistema Youth Orchestra, the after-school program at EA Hall, which is facilitated by the Expanded Learning Program. They're going to be performing with um, UC Santa Cruz and doing um, a production in June, The Little Prince. And they just had a 
uh, performance in Monterey as well with the Monterey um, uh, Orchestra. Some additional celebrations to share with you. Um, PVUSD, uh, as Dr. Rodriguez mentioned um, earlier tonight, that uh, we were recognized as a leader in music education by NAM, the National Association of Music Merchants. Um, individual students were awarded for their designs at Fashion Teens uh, this spring. Holly Oda's uh, choir students were selected to participate in the Allstate Choir at CASMEC this year, and we had that first uh, place award going to Miguel Martinez Villalobos, uh, Villalobos at um, Watsonville High School. We also had a fifth grader at uh, Mar Vista Elementary who won the annual Farm Bureau contest, and that image will be created or turned into a placemat that will be used for one whole year as th that they distribute. We do look forward to um, growing the VAPA department through arts integration, professional development for teachers, and expanded uh, opportunities for students. I want to read this quote um, that an arts education helps build academic skills and increase academic performance while also providing alternative opportunities to reward the skills of children who learn differently. Um, I want to share some of the things that we're focusing on um, for next year, and uh, that is the, the, just the equity of opportunity. Uh, we want students to have opportunities based on community needs at district wide, a scope and sequence that includes. Um, TK through 12 sequential learning from grade to grade. Um, art um, educators in our district are getting the support they need to create uh, to provide the best content possible for students and clarity of outcome. Students um, having the benefit of clear out outcomes defined uh, for all students district wide. And then our in our next steps um, with visual arts. Visual arts will be offered at elementary, middle, and uh, the three comprehensive high schools. Um, through visual arts specialists during release time, through general education teachers, through um, secondary electives and CTE. And so I won't list uh, all there, you can see all this, the schools there. Uh, I want to uh, also just say that we do have the art of ed going out to the general education teachers to, so that they can also teach um, in grades where they don't have a specialist. And I thank you very much for your time in support of the arts programs at PVUSD. Thank you very much. <laughs> do we have any public speakers to this item? We do, we have two, Sarah Webb and Nellie. Good evening. Um, thanks for letting me speak. I, my name is Sarah Webb. I'm a visual art teacher at Watsonville High School and I have two children in the district, and I'm very proud of our robust art program and of my students in school. And I just wanna to speak to one thing that's missing, and that's Lakeview and Pajaro Middle School do not have visual arts classes. Um, and their students, by the time they get to me, they're very smart, they know a lot from the curriculum and from their own lives. And I want those kids to come with me with some building blocks so they can really share their voice and tell stories, represent their ancestors, influence future generations, these are things they want to do, but they need a, some more building blocks. So I'd like you to like really focus on filling in those um, positions at middle schools. And um, thank you so much. Good evening, board. Um, Nellie Bucketta Boggs. Um, I am here to speak on the importance of visual arts and music uh, and theater, all of that, um, in our schools. I am a language learner. I started kindergarten. I did not speak English. Um, and fortunately, that was the late 70s where we were still al allowed to play <laughs> and, and, uh, and have some good fun in, in kinder, and I still remember Mrs. Stevenson's, my, uh, my kindergarten teacher who did not speak Spanish, but was incredible nonetheless. Um, and how does that all relate to where I'm at now? The arts, visual arts to, to start. Um, visual arts allows a person to create something that is concrete, and from that, you can develop language, and that goes into a written language. So. You know, just like that opening um, slide that was in this, um, this presentation, that quote, the arts are an essential element of education, just like reading and writing. These are, it's a, it's a pathway, it's a bridge to connect all of that. And, and it helps 
not only are your neurons in your in your brain like forming and shooting off and creating new ones, you are developing a whole other language aside from your the one you speak. Um, and and so it's really important even in elementary as we grow our literacy skills that we can grow that alongside visual arts and performing arts. So my undergraduate degree is, is in art. I, was, I have a theater degree as a designer. I was not a performer, I was a designer. Um, and that all, again, stems from my entire childhood being influenced and exposed to the arts. I'm also a musician. I started in, in late elementary. I did marching band and orchestra. Um, and so I just wanna speak to maintaining the wonderful program that we have right now. We have a wonderful presentation that was presented to you, Thank you. but next year, that's a different story. And the impact is on the teacher. Thanks. Do we have any discussion from the board? Trustee Scow. Thank you, Stephanie, for that great presentation. Uh, thank you to my, my colleagues on the board and the superintendent for all your past work in developing uh, this program. I think it's really off to a great start. Uh, some of you know I am a professional musician, and um, I have a lot of friends who are music teachers all over the state. And so, and then many of us had great music instruction uh, in California public schools. And it's important to learn history, not only to not repeat mistakes of the past, but also to learn what we used to do well. And we are very heartened to see a recognition that the arts, music, and all of its forms is critical, essential um, to so many ways uh, to our ch children's development, regardless of talent level. It's so good for their social, emotional health uh, and uh, development. So this is an exciting time to be getting the Prop 28 funding to figure out how to enhance the experience. Uh, I don't think it's gonna come to any shock to you that I will be a huge advocate for enhancing this. Uh, I would love to see more instrumental programs in our schools uh, so we can have big bands, orchestras again, um, all, over the, all over the district. I, I think that's something a lot of us want to see happen. Um, and in order to do that, we're gonna have to make sure we're making the right investments, attracting teachers who can afford to live here, paying salaries that can afford, allow them to afford to live here. So um, it's, it, it'll come back to our budget. And as I said earlier, and then we're gonna be discussing later, how do we make this all work uh, amidst other challenges? And I think it really deserves uh, a robust board discussion, uh, one that I'm really eager to have uh, to figure out how we can do this. Uh, and make this really work. And again, thanks again for all the for all the great work so far. Thank you again for your presentation, for all your work. I know you do a lot of great work for our district, so thank you. Mr. Soto. Hey, good evening. I, I was kind of st stay quiet on this one, but this kind of hits home for me because I have four children, uh, two that are currently in college, one that just recently graduated college. And... Um, you know, growing up, I had them involved in sports. Uh, I was pretty involved with, with coaching them, and I kind of hoped that they would just kind of stick with that and, you know, get a, get a career in something. Well, turns out my oldest daughter, who's a graduate of Watsonville High, is a fashion designer down in L.A. currently. She's working with a theater company. Uh, she had a cameo in a Fall Out Boy video. Um, so she's doing well. Uh, my second daughter... She's currently at CSUMB doing theater production. So she's doing the editing and the lighting and all that stuff right now. And, and as a matter of fact, one of my best friends in high school, who's still a good friend of mine, is, her, is one of her professors down there. My son, he's at Santa Barbara right now. He's finishing up. Well, he's doing acting. So, you know, as a father, you know, you kind of want your kids to do something but I don't want to be that parent that says no and you can't do that because that's kind of how my upbringing one upbringing was and Nelly could probably relate to that because you know no mas cierta gente hace eso you know we were always told as kids so I didn't want to be that father and, and I'm proud of them for what they're doing um, you know they're holding their own they're, they're doing doing well 
and uh, yeah, I, I think it might have had some influence with them uh, initially attending Watsonville Charter School of the Arts back in the day before we transitioned them over to private school, but they did start out there and they were involved with a lot of the productions there back when uh, Sue Forson was the principal there. And, you know, as for my youngest daughter, she's kind of following the business line and not really getting involved, you know, in theater or art, but she might get some influence from her siblings and kind of go that way as well. But yeah, it's uh, it's a it's it's interesting, and you know I'm seeing it through my kids and and kind of living vicariously through them, you know, and the things that they're doing, and you know that I think they had a lot of influence from them when they were younger. And so thank you, Flores. Thank you so much for all that you've done with this program, and I just do also hope to see it flourish. Um, again, you know, also my children are at WCSA, so art is very important to us. Um, I, I have a son who's been playing the guitar since fifth grade. He's a sophomore now, has his own band, and loves it. And then my younger two definitely are drawers, and my fourth grade daughter, I mean, it's all she looks forward to, art. Don't pick me up early today. We have art, you know, to, and wakes up. We have art today, so... I know, you know, in elementary, like someone said earlier, you know, it's what they look forward to sometimes. Sometimes that's all they look forward to, some students. And so we need to make sure we encourage that and, and help that flourish in our elementary schools. So definitely thank you so much. Maria? Oh, please. Thank you for presenting tonight. I really love that presentation. And as someone who's loved art for like my whole life, whether it's like painting and my brother plays his guitar like 24 seven and he like formed a whole guitar club at Davis and he's like thriving. <laughs> um, anyways, I just wanted to speak on behalf of students too because as you've all seen and can probably see just from like the pictures itself, they're so lively and you can tell just how much fun they're having. Um, and also, like, I've had the privilege to go to so many different art exhibits around town um, that highlight student work, and it's amazing to see. And also, like, the dance performances, we just had one at Watsonville High, Cultura Caliente, which raised um, scholarship money. So it's helping kids, you know, emotionally, mentally, but also just their well-being. And um, right now, we're doing an art project. Um, I'm in the Art One Ethnic Studies. And... Our, our one is based around how art is healing. And we conducted a survey around school and what we saw was a pattern of students really looking to art as a way to express themselves, but also as like an outlet. And I really resonated with that because it's so much fun, but it's also just so like relieving and it's beautiful what can come out of it. So thank you so much. What a great presentation. Thank you very, very much. It was so nice to hear your voice, and you're perfectly suited for this new job, and I'm really looking forward to watching um, what you do in, in the VAPA world. Um, so go back 12 years. We didn't have any budgets for music or art in our district, and um, many schools um, were participating with um, the HP philanthropy and we had um, I was like the arts coordinator for Valencia and we would write grants and we had to make decisions about okay last year we had performing arts this year we'll do visual and dance so we didn't get everything all the time we had to there's just not enough time in the day for one thing and we had to make decisions about okay we had theater last year and now we're going to do drumming and what you know singing or something so every year it was something different um at some point at valencia i wrote a big grant and put in a music program which i essentially developed with a neighbor um three very talented kids from cabrillo um, who played the piano and were in the vocal uh, music program there and every single we had seven grades were participating in vocal music every week and it was great. And that was all parent-driven and grant-driven. And, you know, there was no budgets at that time. So now we've got sort of an embarrassment of riches, right? We've got 
money coming in to do a lot of stuff, but there's really not enough hours in the day to offer every single type of art to kids. Kid, you know, we're going to have to make some decisions, I think. So I, I also play the piano and played in jazz band in high school. And, um, and I know how important that is to start kids young so that we could build a program all the way up through high school. So I'm very excited to see where this is going. So thank you for your presentation tonight. Thank you. Um, uh, so, Ms. Monroe, I just wanted to say thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm going to probably echo and agree with a lot of what my colleagues have already said, but I, I do want to um, enhance and highlight your presentation tonight. That was a wonderful presentation, one of the best that I have seen yet ever in, in my tenure on this school board. So thank you very much for that. I really appreciated that. It was a wonderful and great presentation and love the visuals with that. Um, my echoing of um, agreement is, uh, yeah, um, you know, both my husband and I are recipients of the benefits of having a balance of not just an education and sports in our life, um, as as well as um, music and arts, growing up and and believed and implemented that in the raising of our children and seeing the benefits of that and um, being an educator myself. Um, I see this in what I work with my students at the higher ed level um, and also trying to teach to that work-life balance and what this brings. And, and we also know at this level that brings a lot more than just work-life balance, right? There are a lot of um, a additional skills that our students and our youth benefit from, from having this. So I look forward to the continued conversations about this and um, what we're going to do as a, as a board to, to continue to promote and enhance this. And um, I look forward to more presentations from you because that was just really wonderful. So thank you for your work you're doing. Uh, I, I have my turn now. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. And you know, one of the things, this is, the arts are one of the reasons why I initially ran to, to be on the school board. It, it's so important to me. It's it's you know it's it's been part of my life since I was a little kid. You know it's like I, I just thinking about I can pull up memories of the smell of turpentine and linseed oil. As you know, my grandmother was a painter, my mom was a painter. You know it's like, and I think about the lessons that go not just the art lessons that were taught, but you know the the value of the craft and the care of things that you know. Our, our ancillary lessons that go along with that of get all the paint out of the paintbrush because that's a sable brush and you will not mess up that brush, right? But it, it you know, it, it taught the value of caring for the tools of the craft, right? And the value of, of taking care of, you know, those tools so that you can make art, you can create in the world. And, you know, I, I still have paintings from my grandmother and my mom on the wall. I did the science illustration program up at UCSC in a previous career lifetime. And other lessons of, you know, whenever you're working on a project, there's, it's often a great big mess before it works out. And there's a lesson of persistence that is so important. And, and that was, you know, when I was doing music, that was also, it's like, if anybody's ever been a musician, and you're learning a piece. It doesn't always sound pretty. <laughs> and so there's there's so many aspects of life that come through the arts. Um, and I'm just I'm so pleased that we are taking a broad approach to how you know we're dealing with the arts, and that we're having we're having performing arts, we're having the visual arts, we're having you know music, and it's it's. Seeing the development of our arts programs over the years, you know, as, as Trustee DeSerpa you know, spoke about, it's like when, when my kids started in PVSD in 2000, my oldest started in PVSD in 2003. And I, I remember just going, as a parent, just going, what my youngest then, you know, was able to, you know, have access to, it's like, we're making it better, 
and and I just as a trustee, you know, wanted to support and see that continue. All right. Uh, yeah. I'd just like to say that um, the Youth Cinema Project is one of um, the best things that I've ever seen, and it's such a beautiful, beautiful program for our kids. And if, um, if you haven't seen um, the films that our kids in this district are creating, um, our, when is the next um, showing of the film? On, yeah, May 23rd. It's on a May Tuesday 23rd. I really Center. invite everybody here yes. to come and see. It's yes. unbelievable. I get the flyer tomorrow. Yeah, so. thank you. <laughs> um, I do have a question about Pajaro Middle School and instruments. Hmm? Is that okay? Can I ask that and, under this item? Um, so I've seen actually um, in social media that there's a, been a call to the community to help replace like damaged instruments because of what happened. Um, with the levy breaking. And I'm just wondering, I'm guessing we have an insurance policy that covers the instruments that might have been damaged in the flood? I think so. that the uh, initial um, probably request went out like Im just immediately to get um, instruments in the hands of students like the, on the day that they came to school. So I know that a request was made, but there's been requests made for instruments that's coming to me right now for ordering for for um, for next year. So my understanding as I've been me meeting and talking with the music teacher, uh, teachers at Paro Middle, is that they have instruments currently to get them through the rest of the year, and then we'll get them replacement instruments for the ones that are, cannot be cleaned. And my understanding is that some are able to be um, rehabilitated and, and returned to the students. So Okay, thanks so much. I was just gonna add to that, um, maybe for Trustee Tuserpa, um to note that um, perhaps at our next safety committee meeting, um, Clint and his team can have a report about that and that, add that to that agenda and then I can report back on that to um, the board. Regarding Correct. Uh, because I think wouldn't that that would kind of fall under Ruth, I believe her jurisdiction sort of speak, if you will. Yes. So just to clarify, there wasn't actually water intrusion in those rooms, and so my understanding is we're able to rehabilitate and clean all those instruments. Um, and so we are doing it out of due diligence, but there actually wasn't any destruction or water intrusion in in those rooms. Okay, if that's all the clarification trustee to serve a field she needs, then I guess there won't be a need to ask for we're, Clint and his team to, to report on it. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, our next discussion item is item 8.2, our general obligation bond overview, and the report will be presented by Dale Scott, um, President Dale Scott of Dale Scott and Company. And Clint. Good evening, President Holm, uh, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Yes, I'm just going to briefly introduce Dale Scott and introduce the item. Um, as many of you know and have seen my presentations, we talk a lot about the facilities of the district and that the state's not actually offering um, a lot of dollars to make repairs to facilities. For those of you who have been on the board for a long time and we're here with the last bond, you may remember we, went, we actually identified about $300 million in need for facility repairs, and we were approved for a bond for $150 million. I'm sure as um, many of you know, Trustee Soto knows, that $150 million, while it did help the facilities, we continue to have aging facilities, so we continue to see more and more need for facility improvements. Um, and one of the only ways really districts see a big influx of funding for facilities is going out for a bond. So in order to do that, it's actually a quite a long and convoluted process. It's not something as simple as just jumping onto the ballot. So we wanted to have Dale kind of jump in and talk about if the board is looking towards doing a bond to be able to improve our facilities, what would the timeline look at, like and what, would, what steps would we need to take and when? So I'm going to let Dale step in and kind of talk about that. Good evening. Um, I am going to give a very short and abbreviated presentation on this. So to give you the big macro picture, and then there'll be one table that has more, uh, more pieces of the puzzle. We can go as deeply as you want, or we can just stop at the macro side, just to give you a sense of where things are going. First of all, I want to show you, thank you. I, I want to show you 
um, both the voter turnout historically, now this is Santa Cruz County in total because we can't get the entire, um, the entire, just the district, and then also your district's party affiliations. If you look to the table, the graphic on the left-hand side, what you see is the turnout by type of election. Now we tend to think, I mean, I know as elected officials you don't, but the public often thinks of all elections as being equal. But they're actually very unequal in terms of who votes and who turns out. The blue are presidential uh, ballot dates, uh, the dark gray are gubernatorial, and the light gray are primaries. So it doesn't take much of a math wizard to see that the really big turnout occurs in the presidential elections. The next presidential election, which I think many of you have probably heard of, is happening soon. It will be in uh, November of 2024. Why is that an important date? We now have 20 years of data uh, that goes back to the beginning of Proposition 39 in California. We can look at all of the election data and it's, it's without, any, uh, without any doubt that uh, the greatest probability of success occurs for a general obligation bond occurs on a presidential election. So I would strongly recommend that if you do go down this road, you look towards that November 2024 date. Big picture items, and this is really the big picture, is sort of where you are now, the planning and structure. Uh, Clint talked a little bit about that. What is the size? What's the amount? What are the projects? How are, what are we planning on using these funds for? What are we planning on not using these funds for? Um, it is typical for a district of this size to then do a voter survey. Um, that's something we typically do for our clients. Uh, some districts bring in an outside pollster. Uh, we're happy to provide the service as well. Um, we come in, <clears throat> we work with a professional polling firm that actually makes calls out of San Diego County. That's both calls, uh, texts, uh, email surveys, they're trying to get a stratified sample of what the voter uh, pool looks like in this district and give us some answers as to how they feel about different tax rates, how they feel about the projects, how they feel about the school, school district in general. It's a really great document to have and to guide you uh, as we go forward. That can happen any time uh, at, you know, as we'll get deeper into it as to the recommendation, but you have the ability to do that um, as a district anytime between now and the next six to nine months. Well, hold on, don't go so fast. One more thing. <laughs> uh, board action. Board action is required to place an item on the board, uh, on the ballot. Two things. One is that typically has to happen no later than, let's call it the end of July. So there's certainly a year or more between now and when you have to take that final action. However, you can do it at any time. And I would urge you to think about doing it sooner than that cutoff date, because a lot of things can happen when you start getting too close to dates that uh, have no uh, wiggle room on them. Um, that is number one. Number two is a general obligation bond in California in order to qualify for uh, being able to be passed at 55% requires, even though it only requires 55% yes vote, it requires a two-thirds vote by the board. Uh, and it's the board seats, not the board members. So seven seats, it requires five yes votes uh, of the board, just to be clear. And then, of course, there's this thing called Election Day. And after you win um, and that is certified, then you have to be able to issue your first bonds roughly in the first quarter, second quarter of 2025. Now the next slide, please. I'm not gonna go into this in great detail. You can look at the various pieces of the puzzle. Um, there's conducting the survey, putting the questions together, drafting the resolution, drafting the language that goes to the voters, uh, drafting a project list. Uh, there's a lot of pieces of the puzzle filing the documents, getting arguments filed by people that support the measure, and then finally uh, vote 
by mail ballots are mailed out. Now, we always say election day because we're used to saying election day, but as we all know, that election day actually begins on October 1st when those ballots begin to be mailed in California now. So there's really a month that goes by as people are voting, and then the cutoff is November 5th, 2024. With that, I'd, I'm happy to answer any questions about the process, where you stand, or anything I may have skipped over. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Discussion from the board. Sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good night. All right. Oh, yes. Um, Dale, I just want to make sure that you stay for the action item. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. We will go on to item 8.3, our playground communication signs, and that report will be presented by Heather Gorman, our SELPA director, our special services, and Shannon McCord, our program special specialist, and Lindsay Kent, our SLP AAC specialist. Good evening, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees and Cabinet. I'm excited tonight to bring this um, project forward. You may have known me to speak a little bit about LRE when I've come up here in the past, the least restrictive environment for students. Well, that doesn't just pertain to the classroom. We're looking at creating access for our students in every aspect of their schooling, and I'm excited that we move forward with this um, initiative and I have Shannon McCord, Dr. Shannon McCord and Lindsay Kent here tonight who are really going to talk you through what our playground communication boards are all about. Thank you, Heather, for that introduction. And yes, we're really excited to talk to you tonight about our playground communication boards. Right, so as you guys know that our children are learning during play all the time and play is a really critical time for their social emotional development and language development and in the words of Fred Rogers, play is often talked about as if it was a relief from serious learning. But for children, play is serious learning. Play is really the work of childhood. And so we recognize that in PVUSD we have over 400 students with complex communication needs who are unable to access communication on the playground. And so they were missing out on this really important time for learning and developing alongside their peers. And we came together and we realized that we really needed to find a way to help empower our students to have communication and to participate fully in their day, not just in the classroom, but also on the playground. There's a lot of science behind what we did. I won't go through all the details for you tonight, but um, please feel free to email us if you want any of the research behind it. There's a lot of evidence base that goes into how we created these communication boards to be evidence-based practice and the best intervention for our students. So the funding that we use to put up the signs, we use low incidence grant funding uh, because the signs are, uh, we put them at four pilot sites. Low incidence funding is for students who have vision impairments, hearing impairments, and severe orthopedic impairments. And so the signs are, um, go ahead and click. Um, we started at Duncan Holbert, which is our preschool site, and this first sign we located um, that this one is a little bit lower because the students are a little bit smaller, and so we installed this one where they can reach it there. And at Valencia, I don't know why that went to Valencia, um, but at Valencia we have a life skills class and a mild moderate program there, and um, it's our North Zone school. And at Landmark, we have a life skills class, mild, moderate, and our deaf, hard of hearing program. And so this sign is a little unique um, in that we also have our signs there with ASL. And then at Bradley, we have three signs. Uh, we have two on the main playground and one on the kinder. Um, and we have our life skills class located there also. And each of these schools have a higher ratio of students with low incidence disabilities. So in order to create these signs, we had a committee of speech therapists and AAC specialists, and we were looking at how do we find the words that are going to have the most impact and beneficial, um, both in English and Spanish for our students, and making sure that they were cross-culturally relevant. 
And the result was that we came up with a communication sign that was in English on one side and American Sign Language on the other side for our students at Landmark. And for the remaining sites, it's in English on one side and Spanish on the other side. And so as you can see, all the signs have the same words on both sides of the sign, whether it's in English or Spanish, or English and American Sign Language. And there's some color coding there based on the word type. All of the signs also have a QR code in the corner, and that links to a website that we built with the assistance of technology, teaching us how to do that. Um, and that links to um, some information for the adults that are helping the children to teach them how to model language so that they can help them to know how to use the signs. Um, and on this uh, landmark sign, on one side, on the ASL sign, it also links to a visual dictionary to so teach everybody how to make the ASL signs. Um, and we, as much as it's a win for us to have these signs um, installed at the schools, we know that it's not enough to just get the signs out there and put them out. And so we also have been providing support at the schools. Um, we this picture here shows one of our speech therapists doing a training um, assembly with all of the staff and students. We've been doing staff meeting presentations. We've been providing some support material. And then we're also going to share with you, we um, made a screencastify that we released. These went in over spring break. And so then on the weekend, right before spring break, we sent this to all the principals to share with all the general education and special education teachers so they would kind of understand what this sign is about. It's the video itself that Dr. Rodriguez shared in her FAQ last week is, is longer, but we made an abridged version to share with you so you can kind of get an idea of what it's about. I don't know if we can. Exciting news about our school. Did you notice what's new on the playground? A playground sign. What is it for? It's how people communicate. Communication is another word for talking sh or sharing our thoughts or ideas. Why do we need it? There are lots of ways to communicate, and some people need tools to help them say what they want to say. AAC is a type of tool for communication. There are lots of AAC tools available. Communication binders, buttons, each generating devices, and communication boards. Hola, mi nombre es Ángel. Este es mi dispositivo. Me ayuda a hablar. Use the playground signs. Touch a word for something you want to say or do. Touch a word to share how you feel. Respond. If a friend touches slide, you might want to respond by saying, Yeah, let's go to the slide. Most importantly, have fun. Maybe talk to some new friends now that our playground has a communication sign. And so we have for you just a few pictures of the playground signs in use. They've been really well received by the school sites, the students, and the staff. And there's been a lot of use already. And so in closing, we just want to share again how excited we are about this project and that not only is it benefiting our students with disabilities or complex communication needs, but really it's benefiting all PVUSD students because they have opportunities to develop empathy and awareness of how others are communicating or their different needs. And also we have exposure to literacy in both English and Spanish on the signs and a universal design for learning that we're creating our playgrounds to be inclusive of all of our learners. And we thank you guys for hearing us tonight, and we're happy to answer questions. And you also have our emails if you have any follow-up questions. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? Sherpa? Hi, this is so great. Wonderful. Can you tell me, aside from Valencia, what's the other school that got the boards again? Um, we have them at Landmark and Bradley and Duncan Holbert. Okay. And of those, aside from Valencia, do the other schools have um, ADA accessible playgrounds now? Any of those? No. no. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
But Duncan Holbert is coming. Yes. Right. We um, put it on the other playground because it's not there yet, but um, so it's on the playground that exists right now. Okay. So I know that Valencia used to host a um, moderate to severe mm-hmm. classroom. And what's, what's the other elementary that has a moderate to severe classroom? Well, there's many. So all of the sites that have them do have, that's what we call life skills, is moderate to severe. Okay. Yeah. So the sites that we chose all have a, a life skills or moderate severe programs at them because those also have students with low incidence disabilities in their classrooms. Okay. So maybe just as a district, when we're replacing playgrounds, we need to really make sure that those particular schools that have moderate to severe classrooms have an accessible playground. That would be awesome because be the bar is not accessible. Um, yeah. I've been bringing that up for a decade. Yeah. Um, and students can't push the wheelchairs in they the bar. And neither can their parents who, are, who might be physically disabled. Mm-hmm. I built the playground at Valencia. I wrote all the grants for it and yeah. did all of that. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. This is wonderful. Nicely done. Thank you. Thank you, Flores. I just wanted to say this is great, and I really um, love the, that you highlighted how it also benefits, you know, the other students with building empathy and other, you know, um, skills that they can also um, get from these signs. So I think it's great, and we should, you know, see them in more of our playgrounds. Just kind of piggybacking on that, you know, it's like having these additional communication tools, it really it, it really does create these really special moments. I had a, a, an incident like a, a few weeks ago, I was walking with my husband and a car stopped and let my husband and I, you know, cross in front of them and it's like, well, they're in their car. And so I was just like, thank you, you know, and and they ended up pulling over and they're like, did, did you just sign thank you? And I'm like, yeah. And what the the person who stopped said is that they're like, and I was kind of blown away by this. I'm like, okay, first of all, why is this person stopping? But they stopped because they they were saying how it just it made a difference to see just a sign being used just just because, and that they had a family member who was deaf and, and used you know ASL, and that seeing it used just as an everyday thing, not as an as an accommodation, but just as a communication made it as it was an inclusion thing. It was just part of the world and that their family member was part of the world. And so when we have these communication boards, you know, it's like we're bringing all our students together. All of our students are part of our world. And, and, and that's the beauty of it. And so this is wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. So we'll move on to our action items. And our first one is the agreement for uh, municipal advisory services, our continuing disclosure ADTR services. Clint. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So yes, uh, before you have, we have a contract with Dale Scott and Company. This is a contract that we've used in the past. What Dale Scott and Company actually provides us, one of the main supports they provide us with our bonds, and as you've seen them speak up here about our COPS, is our annual debt transparency reporting, which is actually required whenever we have debt. So whether it be our COPS or if we're doing bonding, doing those kind of annual reportings that we need to do, We do actually have a financial advisor, which at this time is Dale Scott and Company, who assists us with with all of that reporting. That's actually one of the only things in this contract that is a guaranteed cost to us every year, is that debt debt reporting. The other pieces you'll see in here is there is the option to have, um, as Dale mentioned, a survey done for our our voters to see would a bond pass so that way before we go into the pre-election services and all of those pieces that we'd have to pay a company to support with we actually can do a survey to see effectively a straw poll to see would this bond pass is this something that voters are in support of that is something that dale scott and company does offer so that is also in the contract along with pre-election services as well as the bond um, issuance services to clarify those pieces that are related to the bond as those of you who are here for measure l know those are actually paid for out of the bond they're part of the admin fees that are required when you're um, putting a bond out to the public you got to put those fees into the bond to show there is some 
Um, there is work that needs to be done to actually get the bond passed, to actually then do the reporting, to actually get the issuance, and do again all of the debt transparency reporting. So what we would like to do at this time is move forward with the contract with Dale Scott and move forward with the services that they do offer, which does include that pulling for, of our um, constituents for a potential bond in the future, as well as the annual debt transparency reporting. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the board? And just to clarify, this isn't that we are pursuing a bond at this time. This is to explore options for if it's within the district's best interest. Correct. So if the board approves this, we have Again, the one piece, which is the annual debt transparency reporting, which we'll do regardless if we went for another bond, because we still do have Measure L, as well as our COPS. The other piece that um, we would be able to do with this contract is to do that survey, so the initial survey. As Dale mentioned before, the only way we actually move forward and put a bond on the ballot is the board votes, and the board votes with a two-thirds vote. So this would really allow us to come back to the board at a later date and say we've surveyed the voters, we've established what that bond would look like, do we want to move forward with actually placing one on the ballot? And again, as, as the board knows, there's lots of options that we can pursue within a bond, within a bond whether it's uh, facilities work, if it's workforce housing, all of that can be tied into bonds. So again, this is kind of getting that first pulse of would a bond pass? Because again, there is there is a financial commitment to going out for a bond, as well as many of you know who were on the board, a time commitment for going out for a bond. So we want to make sure that the public actually is in support of what we would need this money for. Um, no further questions or comments? I'll entertain a motion. Making a motion to approve. Did, did you have a question? Yeah, go Sorry, ahead. I can't, how much is this for? Money is this? So again, the only, so the two pieces that we would initiate immediately, so the an, annual debt transparency is the only one that's something we have to do every year. So it's a requirement. That's 5,000. The polling is 15,000 to do the actual initial um, review of the public and see if a bond would pass. The other amounts, like the biggest amount is the 75,000, which is for the bond issuance. That would actually be covered if we approved a bond and moved forward with it. And it would be covered by bond dollars, not by general fund. All right. All right, I have a first. Do I have a second? First and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? I. Sorry, I'm an I. I'm a okay. yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> like, you made the motion. All right. So, <laughs> motion carries six zero one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on to item nine point two, approve resolution twenty two twenty three fifty eight Pride Month and Progress flag. Our report will be presented by Chrissy McLean, uh, coordinator of academics and social emotional counseling programs. Good evening. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Chrissy McLean, Coordinator of Counseling Programs, and I'm happy to be here today to request approval for this resolution that recognizes June as Pride Month and also um, proposes that we fly the, the Progress Pride flag at our sites and at our district office during the month of June and also um, starting on the day of May 22nd, which is Harvey Milk Day. Uh, this this um, resolution is one of the many things that we can do to help students who often feel invisible to help them be seen. And so with that, I would like to read just a few portions of, um, of the resolution. Whereas the rainbow flag, also known as the LGBTQ plus pride flag, was created in 1976 and has become an international symbol of rights and pride. And whereas the progress pride flag is based on the iconic rainbow flag and celebrates the diversity of the LGBTQ plus community and calls for a more inclusive society and includes light blue, pink, and white stripes representing trans and non-binary individuals and includes the brown and black stripes representing marginalized people of color communities. Whereas acts of hatred 
against LGBTQIA plus members of our community will not be tolerated. Hate and discrimination have no part in our community. And whereas all children and youth should be able to attend school in a safe and inclusive environment free from discrimination, and civil rights laws and California Education Code sections 200 to 220 do contribute to such environments. And down near the bottom, whereas flying the Progress Pride flag on May 22nd, Harvey Milk Day, the month of June, and National Coming Out Day further symbolizes the district's celebration of diversity and support for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Pajaro Valley Unified School District recognizes the month of June as LGBTQIA plus Pride Month and will begin the implementation of flying the Progress Pride flag at its buildings on Harvey Milk Day, May 22nd, and continuing through June, as well as on National Coming Out Day, October 11th, to inspire equity, create alliances, celebrate diversity, and establish a safe environment in our schools and community, and that this resolution be distributed to every school in the district. And with that, I ask for approval of this resolution. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Do we have any discussion from the board? I know, you know, for me, it's like I always have to speak on this one, right? But it's like, you know, I, I, I just, this is such an important one. You know, it's like I, I, I wonder, you know, what it would have looked like for those of us, you know, in the community when, when, you know, when I was a kid. You know, none of us were out to each other in, when I was in high school. And just how lonely and isolating that was. And, you know, just it, what a difference it makes to know that uh, the school, the place where, where there is some safety. I know in the past we've had some, some comments in opposition, but this is really important and for those kids who, for whom it's important, for, it's really important for all our kids. Mm -hmm. But it's especially critical for those kids who may not feel safe. And I'm, I'm so glad that we've continued to fly this. So I, I would, I would, I, I would like to m make a motion to approve this item. Um. I just wanted to um, make a comment to this item that um, I, I'm full support tonight of this item. Um, I also think that as a board, um, particularly after what I had noted in my opening comments as a board member of comments that I overheard from um, a member of the public in our audience at our last board meeting against one of um, our very own board members, that was racist and discriminatory when this very um, resolution prohibits that, right? Um, I just feel that we also, as a board, um, need to look to expand this as well um, to other affinity groups. I know many other public K-12 school districts in the, the state and as well as in other states are doing that. So I would just like us to sort of be alert and aware of that about what other affinity groups are we maybe lacking in helping to meet needs of um, going forward. So that would just be my two cents to add to um, my support of this and um, going forward to look to that. Because if it's happening against our very own board members, it's there's a problem. We've got a problem and that tells me it's not isolated. Thank you. We have a first and a second. If there's no further comments, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 601. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item 9.3, approved memorandum of understanding between PVUSD and PVFT, um, Pajaro Middle School Temporary Relocation 2023-24. Uh, Allison Iazawa. Yes. 
Thank you, President Home Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So we worked with PBFT on this MOU in front of you tonight, um, and it is for the teaching staff at Pajaro Middle. Next year, as we know, um, Pajaro Middle will be um, continuing for 7th and 8th grade at Lakeview Middle School. And then the current 5th graders at Ohlone and Hall will stay at those two schools for their 6th grade year. And with that, four teachers currently at Pajaro Middle will need to go to, two will go to Ohlone and two will go to Hall, and then the rest will stay at Lakeview. And so this MOU gives them time in order to move their classrooms, as well as ensures them that once Pajaro Middle physical building reopens, that they are still Panthers, and they are still part of Pajaro Middle, and they will still have their teaching positions um, when the school site reopens. So um, we shared this with teachers last week. Like I said, we worked collaboratively with PBFT, so I, I um, respectfully request that you please approve this MOU tonight. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? Can I I'd get like a to make a comment. Oh, sure. So I just want to thank the diversity of the staff that are making these adjustments, you know, in light of the situation, especially being Pajaro Middle under my area. Um, you know, I know it's I know it's hard to kind of make changes and schedule changes when you're used to doing something, but right now, uh, like we used to say in the military, you adapt and you overcome. And right now, this is your moment to adapt and overcome and, and serve the children because they're our main priority. Um, so I'm... I'm in support of this resolution, and I thank the staff for making those efforts to, to make the changes. So thank you. Thank you. Is that, is that a motion? Thank you. I have a motion. A second. And a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 601. All right, moving on to item 9.4, Summer Arts Integration Institute. Um, report will be presented by Stephanie Monroe. Thank you. Good evening again, President Holm and Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez. Each year, PVSD partners with other districts and the County Office of Education and the Santa Cruz Arts Council to provide an arts integration workshop for uh, teachers in the county. And the arts integration um, Institute brings together K-12 classroom teachers, teaching artists, and school administrators to promote academic achievement, equity, and equal access through an in-depth learning experience in the arts. And it's a four-day workshop acquiring tools in the artistic process, including visual arts, music, and performing arts. Um, PVSD offers 10 scholarships for student, for teachers, some of whom are general education teachers, to gain a deeper understanding of best practices for teaching all subjects through arts integration. The Arts Integration um, Institute participant outcomes are explore the relationship between racial justice and equity and the arts, examine the attributes of culturally relevant curriculum and, and, and instruction, reimagine teaching, utilizing the arts to support social emotional learning and academics, and gain an understanding of arts integration and its value in student learning, learn tools to promote the four C's, critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication, and experience cross-disciplinary lessons with, uh, that support college and career readiness. And so we are looking for the board's approval of this expenditure. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers for this item? No, we do not. Any discussion from the board? All right. Um, I'll make a motion to approve. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. All right. So moving on to item 9.5, elementary science curriculum adoption. A report will be presented by Michael Russo, science director. Good evening, board president Holm, board of trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Mike Russo, the science director. And in our ongoing efforts to update our science curriculum, I believe this is our 10th adoption in the last four years, and I believe it is probably the last science adoption. 
Uh, our TK5 elementary science teachers have recently evaluated new next generation science standards instructional materials. I am here tonight to provide you with a brief overview of the selection process and the teacher's recommendation. Our pre-screening process began in the fall of 2021 uh, when we evaluated 11 publishers, all recommended by the CDE, by the State of California. Um, the team eventually chose two publishers that scored the highest in order to pilot those in their classrooms, which we did this spring. There was a one-year postponement last year due to the lack of subs in order to pilot and do all the trainings and meetings with the teachers. So uh, we had on the pilot team an amazing dedicated pilot team of 17 TK5 teachers representing 12 elementary schools. And they ended up spending four and a half weeks piloting in their classroom, both Twig and then another four and a half weeks piloting Amplify Science. The process that we used to evaluate those publishers was an NGS toolkit for instructional materials evaluation, and we also used our district lens. This is the same process we have used for all our science adoptions up to this point. So I won't go spend a lot of time going through it, but these are the five criteria that both publishers using the print and the digital were evaluated on. And these are all NGSS aligned criteria. So the use of phenomena to drive instruction in cycles of inquiry, logical sequence of instruction, students figuring it out or doing the critical thinking, and then criteria four are the three dimensions of next generation science standards. And criteria five is a district specific lens. And this was developed by teachers and district leaders years ago to highlight the most important district specific adoption criteria relevant to our PVUSD students. So you'll see things on there like student talk, student discourse, uh, bilingual multicultural resources, uh, differentiating and scaffolding for a variety of students and technology integration. So the pilot teachers strongly recommend the adoption of Twig Science based on many criteria but, and many reasons, but some of them that stand out. Uh, one of the things I remember the teachers uh, in our decision day talking about was how important it was to really be engaging for our students, especially at the elementary level, right? They come in excited about science and we wanna keep them excited and curious about science. So there is that 5E lesson format that TWIG uses. That's one of the ways it's engaging. They have some really high quality science videos as well. Their student book uh, is very engaging as well and it can be used for multiple purposes. The other thing that teachers highlighted that they really liked, and this was especially important for maybe some of the self-contained classroom teachers, is that TWIG Science offered them a lot of flexibility in order to adapt the curriculum to their students' needs. Um, and then finally, very important and highlighted in our district lens, our strong literacy supports as well. So it comes with leveled readers that make it really easy to integrate English language arts into the science curriculum and vice versa. And um, a lot of language routines that promote student talk that help develop student language. So based on those reasons and the recommendation of our team, they highly recommend that the board, PVUSD school board, approve TWIG science as the new TK5 elementary science adoption beginning in August this year. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do, we have one, Tara McCullough.
Evening again. I'm Tara McCullough. I'm a 4-5 science release teacher at Starlight Elementary. And I pi piloted both the Amplify and the TWIG program in my classroom with fifth grade students. And I was really happy to have that opportunity and that to be that process. And, and I really want to thank Michael and um, Jess Suklis and all of the teachers who worked on it because they, they put a lot of time and energy into trying to pick the best um, possible program. And I'm happy to, to have it after nine, nine years after NGSS was actually implemented in California, we finally have an elementary science program. So um, we've been really creative up until now, and now we get to really del delve into a good program. Um, I want to kind of circle back because um, we've talked a lot about the VAPA programs tonight and how um, enriching they are for students, and um, science is, is similar in that way. And it's so based on curiosity and um, finding evidence for how things work. And um, it really takes time, and it's, it's also messy, and there's um, lots of prep involved in um, projects. And it can be a little daunting for, for people who are in um, gen general education to dive into it. So I'm really hoping that the district um, supports the program fully by offering lots of really meaty um, science uh, training uh, through this program so that gen ed teachers can access it. Um, and, and it's a pretty approachable program, but I think they need um, some really good education um, and training. Um, and I also want to make sure that there's time in the school day set aside and prioritized for science. And in the same vein as we were talking about with adding music in, I'm really hoping that that doesn't uh, supplant uh, our, our Sci our efforts in bringing science. Because elementary school is last in the adoption process, it is also really important that it gets uh, enough energy and enough time to, to do it well. Thank, Thank you. you. Do we have any discussion from the board? Trustee Scout? I have, a, I have a question, just curious. Um, in any of the curriculum, are, we, are they dissecting animals in schools? No, they're not. Uh, was there a policy decision here or in the state or uh, get away from that? Some of the high schools m might do some dissections, but students have the option to opt out of it if they do. There's not, it's no longer required. And most students, most uh, classes, they have digital simulations now as well that they can use in, in place of real dissections. So that, that has changed a lot from years ago when I was a biology teacher at Watson High, for example. I'm just curious. You yeah. have to explore a in San Francisco and you dissect an, a, ca an, a cow's eyeball. Yeah, the cow's eyeball. Yeah, you used experience. to do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kids remember that years later. You come back. Here I am asking you yeah. about it. Thank you. Trustee DeSerpa. Thanks for the presentation on the curricula. Um, I'm wondering... I know, like at Valencia, we had um, a science teacher. Mm, science release teacher. Uh -huh. Release teacher, yeah, mm -hmm. which was wonderful. So that the kids, at least fourth, fifth, and sixth, were getting, you know, like an hour or more of science curriculum every day. Um, do we have that same thing happening in any other of the elementary schools? Yeah, we have uh, nine science release teachers at nine schools, and we also have one at Alianza at the charter school, so t 10 total. And is it just mostly for fourth, fifth, and sixth? Uh, and well, six, yes. It's mostly, in the K-6 schools, it's uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And in the K-5 schools, it's typically fourth, fifth, but there are some science release teachers also teaching third, fourth, and fifth. Thank you. If there are no further comments, I'll entertain a motion. Got a motion, do I have a second? I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. All right, uh, going so much, on, you're welcome. Especially on the behalf of our dedicated pilot teachers <laughs> and the team, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, moving on to item 9.6, our Community Foundation Single Agency Fund Agreement. Uh, Clint, it's back to you. 
Good evening, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. So I have before you um, an agreement, uh, actually the release of funds from the agreement we have with the Santa Cruz County, um, the Santa Cruz County Community Foundation. Back when we were getting donations for Starlight Kitchen and Garden Project, we actually reached out to the um, Community Foundation to see if we could actually utilize their platform to make it easier to get donations from the public and have more access to donors. So in doing that, we actually did quite get quite a few donors to utilize that platform. As you can see, we're asking for the disbursement of $538,240. Um, again, this is money that's already was allocated to Starlight Kitchen, we used cash on hand to be able to pay for the um, current improvements. This is refunding back what we spent already from the Santa Cruz Treasury. So really what this is doing is just asking the board to close the account with um, the Community Foundation and move the funds into our Treasury account. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Discussion from the board. Can I have a motion? A motion to approve. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on to item 9.7 approved notice of award for Renaissance High School HVAC modernization project. The report will be presented by Erlindo Fernandez, Director of Maintenance and Operations and Facilities. Good evening, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, board members, cabinet. My name is Arindo Fernandez, and I'm the director of maintenance and operations. Um, for this item, I'm bringing forward is the Renaissance High School HVAC modernization project. This is an ESSER funded project. Um, back in March 3rd and 10th, the district advertised the Renaissance High project. And a mandatory bid walk was held on March 14th. Five contractors were present that day. On April 4th, the district received three sealed bids from the following contractors. As you can see from the tabulation here, we had um, Premier Builders with a price of $98,981. Few Services, $27,700. Pueblo Construction, $52,400. 106 was 71 dollars one of the requirements that we had for this job was that the contractor do all the abatement for this project and oversight the two contractors that um, their bid was low lower they didn't include the abatement or they didn't want to have any part with the abatement with their bid that's the that's the why the difference in prices this year because of the abatement the premier builder is the only one that accepted to submit a bid with the uh, abatement included in it so i'm asking the re the board to please approve the contract amount for ninety two thousand nine hundred and eighty one dollars for premier builders to proceed with the contract for the hvac at renaissance high Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? By all means, go ahead, Trustee Soto. So early on this, uh, thanks for getting this squared away because this place needs it bad. Uh, in that scope, has er have areas been identified that are hot that need abatement, or is this a contingency in, no, case, they, in case? Yeah, they, they have been identified. That's all we asked for. Okay, we so, did, uh, so it's known service the yeah. areas that are hot that are going to need abatement. Yeah, they are going to need abatement. That's why the price is uh, reflects on this the on the bids here. Okay, because of the abatement. Um, can I have a motion? I have first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 601. All right, moving on to item 9.8, requested presentation items for upcoming special board study session on budget. Our 
uh, report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah, thank you very much. So on March 8th, the board asked for a special board study session um, in terms of budget. So two things really for this conversation. One is what are the topics in which the board would like to hear? Um, we I did receive at the end limited um, requests, um, but I want what we want to make sure and do is have the staff because they're busily f uh, finalizing the June 14th and the um, June 28th budget adoption. Uh, we want to make sure one that it meets your needs, but also that staff is aware of what specifically you all wanted to look at. Um, and then second, because there are actually going to be three budget presentations in the interim, so. Clint does a May revise, which is going to happen on May 24th. Um, we always do the June 14th budget presentation and then also the June 28th budget adoption meeting. We want to see, one, what it is that the board wants to hear, and then two, if we're able to fold in to one of those three meetings. If it's not possible, um, then we, of course, will have the 20th, and it can be scheduled. We did it as an action item, so in case, um, as you are listing off the different things that you would like to hear, um, Clint will be able to address um, whether or not we can fit it into one of those three, so you can have the information um, but not have to have it. I will just say on a note, um, board can always request for us to put something on the agenda if for, for throughout the year, if there's something in particular that you want to hear about, then you can request from agenda setting. Also, as has been done in the past um, during one-on-ones when board has requested, um, I can either provide the information or Clint is more than willing to also be there present. Um, so we wanted to open the conversation of what is it that you would specifically like to see um, and then we will determine um, the location of that information. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee Flores? Um, yeah, I would just like to, you know, let it let you be, let be known what I'd like to see. Um, I know after I was um, placed on the board, I did sit down with Dr. Rodriguez and Clint and was presented um, a PowerPoint of the budget. And it was a very um, nice PowerPoint. And I remember mentioning, you know, I think this is great. I think this shouldn't just be for a trustee. I think this should be for the public. And I believe that exact uh, PowerPoint was later shown. Um, but I did also say that as a trustee, I would like, I would have liked to something a little more in depth. I would have liked something with a little more, um, more spelled out, you know, the line items, not just, oh, this is salary and this is, you know, benefits and this is this. Um, I, I, really like to see it all. Um, I, oh, coming into this position, I've heard and been told um, s specific things that I haven't, I have no clue how to address. For example, um, I know C Chris has mentioned before, you, there's a vehicle stipend. I haven't seen that in any budgets. I have no clue what that is. Um, so any other items like that, I'd like to see. Um, I've heard from my, some of my constituents that um, the district gives a lot of money to nonprofits and to spends a lot in this and that. And so I'd like to see that specific, spelled out because I wasn't here as a board member when I guess those were those funds were allocated. Um, and I'd like the budget also, I'd like to see, I know we say we have this $300 million budget. I know some, all, not all of it is general funds. Some of it is for migrant education. Some of it is for SELPA. Some of it is it. So I'd like maybe some that also spelled out. Um, and I don't, I mean, I feel like this shouldn't be too difficult, you know, with all these accounting softwares that we have, you know, there's always a report section and you go to that section, you say, this is what kind of report I want, you click the button and it spits it out. So just something with a little more in depth, you know, seeing exactly where our dollars and cents are going is what I, what I would like to see. So just, just clarifying. So Every time we do the budget, then about, I don't know, it's 150 pages or so of the budget, it, it's attached. So all those items are attached. So, so you, are, is it specific um, 
I already heard some. So I heard um, monies for nonprofits, um, general fund versus restrictive funding. Um, so I heard that, um, like the vehicle stipend, that's in our contracts. So that is only cabinet members, but that, that you would find that in our contracts, which then would go on the salary line is what you would wind up finding that on. But um, so um, how would, is there is there a way that we can maybe sit down, you and me beforehand, we can look over some of the other areas that you would like to see? Because there is 160 pages of line items in the, in the attachment. So I wouldn't want us to miss um, one specific area that you would like to know about. It always is, yeah. So if you go back in past in any of the past budgets, um, there's the um, there's the PowerPoint, and then on that, and it's open to the public, so anyone can see it. Is the packet, and it's on. It has been there for the seven years that I've been here. Every single time that we present, so line by line, it's on there. Um, so I just want to make sure that we know which one it is that people would like to do. And then just for notice as well, every time that we do, any time that we pay out, that's in the warrants. So that's in each and every month when we're paying out, then that is actually in the warrants of who we're paying for. But we can definitely do a listing um, of the nonprofits. Most of that, kind of to your point, most of that is um, not general fund. I think almost almost none of it is general fund. Um, do you want to speak on it too, Clint? Yeah, just to clarify, um, the budget document that's attached does split out by each fund as is required by school accounting um, requirements through GASB 34, we actually have to do that. So each fund is split out, fund one, which is general fund. It's split out between restricted and unrestricted funds. Then we have fund six, which is um, actually our bond. Then we have fund 11, which is gonna be um, adult ed, fund 13, food service. I won't go into all of them, but they're all actually split out. They're not split out line item as in, here is one thing you purchased, because again, that is, as Dr. Rodriguez mentioned, spelled out in our warrants each year. We can definitely provide that to board. The problem with trying to provide it in a simple format is if I had to guess for all of our transactions, all of our payroll lines, it's probably a million lines of Excel because again, for each employee, we probably have about 12 lines because again, you have salary, STRS, you have Medicare, FICA, unemployment, you have health and welfare, you have potentially a cell phone stipend. So, it doesn't get that granular, but again, everything is approved through the board, whether it's through the personnel report where we're asking to approve a position or approved through, um, again, PO and warrant reports, which as you see on this one are always in consent agenda as the first two items. So the PO report being we're asking to spend X and then the warrant report being we've now spent X. So, um, but to Dr. Rodriguez's point, I'm always happy to provide specific um, drill downs into an object code or to say, hey, I really want to see what does this million dollars look like spread out. I would only caution to try and provide all of it without really the context of I want to look at specifically X is you're going to get a lot of lines of data um, and we could run reports, but again, they're, they're 100 page reports for one object code. Trustee Scow? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so I definitely understand the, uh, the the discussion on how to present a lot of information. Personally, I'm interested in in a presentation information that shows here's what's going on with the general fund. I understand after school is different. That's an important thing for us to understand. And looking at the big picture here, we're look, we're working towards a budget approval on June 28th, I believe. And so we're and we have some meetings before that. So it's leading up to that. And so, I mean, I think given what the discussions we're having tonight and what we've been having, we want to have a really good handle on what we're also voting for next year. And so uh, what I was thinking May 20th in my mind could help us prepare for that as we get into those discussions. Where have we been this year and years prior? Um, 
you know, thank you for, for sharing the actual budgets. Um, I think there's some good news there in terms of the financial picture. Uh, on our sites, I'm hearing concerns about underinvesting in some of the in some of the staffing needs and some of the things we're hearing tonight about FAPA. Can we afford? What can't we afford? Should we always try to save money, or can we spend a little more? Those aren't obvious questions, and there will be various opinions about the answer to that, probably on our board and within our community. And so, it just deserves a good discussion, debate, and I think um, with respect. So, bringing that back to my request to the general fund. One thing I hear about all the time is classroom sizes. What's the form of the ratio there? We have uh, some pretty big classroom sizes and, and it varies school to school. I, and, and I can surmise and I've gotten some info as to why that is, but how can we address that and maybe improve that coming ahead? So it's good to know where we've kind of come from on some of those questions and, and how uh, the money, how that money's, how, whatever formulas are being there and how we might if we want to improve those things. So this, it's a big thing. So I get your question, well, how do, I, how do we present that in, in a way that's you know, not going to be six hours? But it's th it, I, hopefully it won't take that long. But I, I know the Watsonville City Council just had a day-long budget retreat with a facilitator about some of these very items. So it is our budget. It is our item. It is, our mo it is the district's money, the community's money. So um, I just think it's, it's super important. So... Um, how it can be presented in, in a timely, uh, some, in kind of a summary way is, is I'm, I, I'm not sure how to tell you exactly how to do that right now, but those are the big questions in my mind uh, as we get ready to approve a budget for the next year. Just because you're going to be the one that's going to be preparing it, do you have any follow-up questions in terms of um, what that means, in terms of what they wish to see? Yeah, so I think, um, I, again, the in terms of how we show in a budget class size, I don't know how that we show it by position. So we can break down how many positions each site has. Those positions are based on enrollment. So if we have, for example, 50 students at um, Alianza in second grade, that requires two teachers. We budget out two teachers for it. The class size isn't necessarily determined at the time of budget. That's not what we do in budget. We don't determine necessarily the class size at that time. We determine how much we need to be able to support the number of students at that site. Um, so again, I don't know how in a budget presentation we would necessarily focus on the details of class size. A lot of that is negotiable as um, you've heard Nellie speak to. So typically those items are talked to the, with the board during negotiations, how much it costs, can we afford them or not. Um, we don't make class size changes during budget time, we make it during negotiations. Trustee DeSerpa? Yeah, I was just gonna say that that class size reduction is is something that's negotiated and completely dependent, yeah, on our budgets though, really. But uh, the bigger pic the bigger the biggest picture to me is that something like eighty eight like I don't know what the new um, percentage is of how much of our budget goes to salaries and benefits. It had been up at 89%, then it went down to about 84. I'm not sure where we are now. Do you so know? So with unrestricted 91%, and again, I typically look at unrestricted because we're not receiving dollars that specifically say you must spend it on X and that X not being salaries. So it gives a little bit of a dis but, distorted so picture, but just saying, yeah, it's, in a, it's yeah. still around 85 when you include both restricted and unrestricted. So that doesn't leave the district very much money to spend on anything else, including facilities, transportation, the extra special ed money that encroaches on the general fund, and things that we would like to see improved on behalf of the kids. So, I mean, and I mean, the good news is that we've got unions that are very strong and negotiate well on behalf of our staff, right? And so we want to retain and recruit the best and the brightest for this district. And so to the extent that we have, that we can, we always try to um, provide the, you know, the biggest raises that we can afford. But what that means is that the rest of the budget is very lean 
for everything else. And that's why some of our facilities don't look that great. And we have to go out to the voters and ask the public or the taxpayers to foot the bill on our facilities improvements. Um, so anyway, I don't know if that is helpful or not, but that's what I learned like my first few years on the board. It was like, oh my God, there's not a lot left over after we pay all the bills for our teachers and staff and administration. So um, I, I felt that at the March 8th meeting, I had communicated pretty well what it was that I was looking for. So I'm not sure why it's necessitated that I have to reiterate it again here tonight, but I will do that. Um, so one of the main things I had asked for with this up and coming meeting is that in well in advance of time was that um, each of us as colleagues get a full printout of the budget and a binder with line items um, for us to go through both for this school year and the projected next, which we are going to have to be approving by June 28th um, in order to meet our timeline with the turning that into COE. Um, so that's in a nutshell what I'm looking for. I think that there have been a lot of good comments made um, and reiterating back to what things I'd said on March 8th. Um, there has been criticism of this board, um, the previous board, um, and the administration um, of concerns and with our budget and things that have been brought up by both unions as well as members of the public and concerns. So I think having a, a session such as this that is just devoted to this topic um, and being as transparent and open with that as possible um, and, and to have that space for us to ask questions and for our unions to ask questions and members of the community to ask questions, um, I think it's an appropriate setting. And it's, I think, a bit of a deeper dive than what we would get um, at the May 24th of the third interim report and the June um, 14th presentation and then just the rubber stamp approval on June 28th. So that that's... My reiteration of what I've already said more than, well, actually two months ago now, two months and two days. So then we would not be able, if that is your request, as we stated before, then we would not be able to do it on May 20th because it will not be ready. So it will be ready by June 14th um, and not very not very early prior to that. Um, that is part of the June 14th. And what my suggestion is, and is that we do a special board study session between, and let me know if this would work, Clint, between June 14th and June 28th. Staff will not have it, the books ready, and it will not be ready for May 20th. They, there's no way that they can get it done by then. Um, because we are closing things out and getting things ready. Literally, Colleen will spend weekends and Clint will sp spend weekends and, and long nights to get it ready. Basically, we'll have it ready for the posting on the 14th, which is um, that Friday prior, but it won't be ready. If, if what you want is to be able to see it in hard copy, for next year, that won't be ready on May 20th, and that's what we stated on March 8th. It won't be ready. So then we would need to change the date of the special board study session. And if that's inaccurate, Clint, then I need you to... No, that would be accurate. So again, we can get last year's budget and pull out the actuals and pull out line item by line item actuals. However, up until, as Dr. Rodriguez noted, up until about June 12th, <laughs> I mean, Colleen's building everything in the budget still. She's still making sure. I mean, remember, we do have May revised come on May 17th, which means until May 17th, we can't even finalize the budget with the estimations from the state. So that alone stops us from being able to finalize the budget until typically beginning of June. Um, remember, when we do the budget, we're actually doing two pieces. So we're doing the estimated actuals from this year, 
and we're also doing budget for next year. Both of those have to go to the June 14th meeting, so neither of those are actually done um, until about that meeting. So if you're asking for a prior year, meaning 21-22 actuals, 100% um, we have those. But for this year's actuals and next year's projections, those actually won't be complete until probably, again, June 10th, June 9th, around that time frame. Right, but you do have unaudited actuals for this school year. For this current school year? Correct. No, no, no. Current school year unaudited actuals come in September because that'll be unaudited actuals for what we've spent for this year. We have unaudited actuals from 21-22, so we're always a year behind because the auditors are looking at the finalized year. And unfortunately, due to COVID and the lack of auditors, as the board knows, we have not even had our finalized audit yet. So, so we have unaudited actuals from 21-22, not current year. So, it's just, yeah, so in other words, it's just still the projections of what was approved by the board on June, the end of June 2022. Yeah, we have, again, we have, est we have that, that estimates, estimates from second but interim, but yeah, unaudited. nothing concrete of what we think we'll actually spend. And as you know from prior years, a lot can change between second interim and estimated actuals. I'm okay with getting all of that back up electronically. I really don't want that much paper and... I, you know, I would encourage our other board members to go electronic on this as well. It's a lot of paper. Um, the other thing is I'm away in Sacramento for CSBA delegation uh, on the 20th, so I couldn't make that meeting anyway, so I would prefer it to be later. Well, again, we want to make sure that it meets the needs. So if the request is to have the, this year's and next year's projections, then we would need to move it. And I'm, we're more than happy to have the special board study session. So it's not about that. I just want to make it productive. I don't want people to come in expecting one thing and then being frustrated that they didn't receive what they wanted. And so we would need to, we can definitely do something between June 14th and June 28th um, where you can dive into it and dig into it. Um, so basically what we could do if, if it's acceptable to board is on the 14th, Clint could do the presentation, try to include some of this information that was requested. Um, and then we could have the special board study session between those two dates um, where we could um, dig into it. Um, well, I think I also heard Clint, I mean, and based off of what you were saying, because agenda setting committee would meet on June 8th to create the June 14th board meeting, correct? And so the budget would be prepared for the June 14th meeting by then. No, it would be done by Friday afternoon. It would be so time Friday, by posting. By Friday the night. Right, Friday the the, the so, at 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. So I, I would just... Um, recommend the 10th and the only reason I'm request m moving to also that is just in recognition that if we were to do what you were just proposing between June 14th and June 28th and we were looking at it being a Saturday um, you know one of those Saturdays is Father's Day weekend and um, I'm concerned you know we do have um, several board members who are fathers and um, others who are married to yeah. husbands that are fathers and um, as well as well, staff we and administration, so um, I, I would really want to sway away from that date, well, we, and we the 21st getting pretty close. Yeah, we wouldn't have to do a Saturday. The reason why we did a Saturday this one is because of all the activities that are happening in the month of May. We didn't, <clears> like I literally don't have a free night, so it was because of all of our special events that were happening is the reason why we didn't, we did a Saturday. So we'll already have students graduated and so we i mean it's up to the board when they want to have it but um i i, I like i like the saturday idea i think mm -hmm. it's um, starting in the the mid-morning and it's it's you know much easier than hammering after a long hard day that we all work um for the deep dive and that's my two cents on it so I mean, ideally, I think the um, Saturday, the tenth of June, is a good day. I, I is that reasonable, I Clint? Would waver from the seventeenth, again, because it being that weekend. Um, just trying to honor our fathers in the community, and then I think the twenty-fourth, kind of pushing it. I just to let you know, I will not be available the weekend of the tenth. 
I, I kind of like the 17th, but I hear we, the 17th is better for me personally, but definitely understand wanting to, and it's, it, it is a busy time of year. Could um, we do it on that Friday? I yeah, I can't do the 10th either. I'm away that weekend. Would we be able to do that Friday so that it's not so close to Father's Day? Would the 16th work? I don't even know what I'm doing. This. <laughs> I, I, I could do the 17th, but I'm on a flight on the 16th. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be out of town as of that Friday. Uh, the, what is it, the 16th? Until okay. until the following Monday, so I'm I'm gonna be. Sixteenth, you leave. Yeah, yeah, for seven days, ten days, whatever it is, to the twenty fifth, twenty sixth. Country. Is it? What about on the Wednesday night, in between the two? Is that the twenty first? Um, we we can definitely we don't have to do a Saturday. We could do the twenty first. The twenty first. The Wednesday, the twenty first. It would be the Wednesday in between. Or the twenty or Saturday the twenty fourth. I think we have only one trustee that's not available on the seventeenth. No, actually I Oh, okay, so the 21st doesn't work for you either. Okay. So we, we have, so the 17th, we only have one person who can't come, but the 10th, we have multiple people who can't come. The evening? Um. On a Saturday, you usually don't do evenings, but it no. doesn't no, mean that we could. I'm saying if we did it during the week. Oh, yeah, we would do it. We would do it generally at 6. We do our, our I mean, it, it could be a different day. We, you, we choose Wednesdays a lot because people have their Wednesdays kind of like set for, you know, board things, but it doesn't have to be a Wednesday. The only reason why I think it would be better to do it in between is because then you get the opportunity to already hear Clint's initial presentations and then you can have consider questions that you want to then be addressed during that special. So like if you hear it and he includes some of these things that was mentioned, um, and I, th I think there's some ways of, of doing, you know, everything that people requested, then you would, then you could even say during his presentation, okay, please hi, please explain this in further detail, you know, versus having you have the big presentation and then he presents something fairly similar at the fort on the 14th. But um, that's, I just think I'm, uh, sometimes I think of efficiency, so it's like I just think it's more efficient to allow him to present and then to have the information sink in and then be able to ask questions and request information for the special. I think Dr. Rodriguez makes a very good point with that. Um, I think that means that we would be ideally looking at Saturday the 17th or Wednesday the 21st, and I think so far, We've only heard that there's only one trustee who's here tonight that's not available on either one of those days, correct? So, not available on the 21st. Uh, trustee, trustee Soto, Soto is leaving. Oh, he, both of those. Yes. Right, because Trustee Flores, you were saying that you were leaving on the 22nd. Okay, so you, are, so you, you weren't saying that you weren't available on the 21st, it just... No, I think it's the 21st. Okay. How do you, and I think, um, I come back to the idea, I think, that Trustee Scow pointed out earlier, similar to what the city recently did, was having a, a retreat deep day dive on it was, it's helpful and it's, it's transparent versus trying to just slot it in at a six o'clock board meeting at night um, in between two sessions. So I would, you know, pr lean towards the Saturday the 17th. I think, what were we, uh, I think we were originally talking about starting at 10 or 11, I don't remember. I think. 
I thought that you requested nine, but I was going to ask you oh. to said nine. <laughs> I think I said ten, and you requested nine. Um, <laughs> it doesn't matter to us. Okay. Yeah. I, I just think that it's that's ideally better than after a long. Day. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to recap. So, who was it that could not be present on the seventeenth? Um, and everyone else was able to. Would you be willing, um, Trustee Soto, would you be willing to just um, do some type of special meeting if you watched the video and needed it with us? Or yeah. I hate to do that to you, but like Clint and I would be happy to sit down and, yeah, and, we, we can always and do, do something, anything that you needed. Something separate to catch yeah. up. We'd be yeah. happy but to I catch you up. I am going to be indisposed at that time for the whole week, as a matter of fact. So what I'm hearing is, you know, having moving the special board meeting to June 17th, starting at 9 a.m. 10 a.m. Okay. okay. And. And we do it like say 10 to 3. Would that be good? So five hours. And you were able to capture the requested items. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Does someone want to make, I'll make, so I'm making a motion to move the special board meeting that was originally scheduled for May 20, Saturday, May 20th to Saturday, June 17th um, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries five zero one one. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, moving on to our consent agenda. So uh, these are our routine items. Do we have any public speakers to consent? We do not. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? All right. Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as is. And can I have a second? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 6-0-1. And can I have the action report on closed session? Um, yes. Um, under closed session, closed session, oh my gosh, I'm getting my words out. Under closed session agenda item 2.1 i move to approve the recommendation of the district administration of a full expulsion until december 2023 for student number 22-23-011 and student number 22-23-012 oh wait I don't know why. I'm sorry. We did vote on this. I'm so sorry. It's saying I moved to. Sorry. My notes are, are reading wrong. The board moved to approve, excuse me, closed session agenda item 2.1 um, for the recommendation of the district administration of a full expulsion until December 2023 for student number 22-23-011 and student number 22-23-012 in a 601 vote. Sorry about that. Clarification there. Um, okay. Um, um, on closed session item 2.2, .2, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on May 10th, 2023, with 69 and 10 additional items. That one I do need a second on. Thank you. First and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> Any opposed? <laughs> Motion carries 601. On closed session item 2.3, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on May 10th, 2023 with 10 and 10 additional action items. I'll need a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Wonderful. And I have, um, we do have two announcements. Um, PVUSD is pleased to announce the selection of Ms. Holly O'Brien as the new academic coordinator for Minty White Elementary. Ms. O'Brien has been working with students since 2008 when she started as a substitute with PVUSD. 
In 2013, she began teaching as a reading intervention teacher with McQuitty. She has also held positions as a RISE program teacher and a home hospital teacher, a new teacher project mentor, and most recently as a teacher on special assignment supporting special education teachers. Ms. O'Brien holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Administration of Justice from San Jose State University and a mild moderate special education credential from CSU Monterey Bay. Ms. O'Brien is currently in the Bridges of to Leadership Preliminary Administrative Credentialing Programming program and will hold an administrative credential in the fall. We are excited to welcome this highly qualified educator to her new position. Congratulations, Ms. O'Brien, and go Eagles. Okay. Wonderful. Um, second and the last announcements, PBUSD is pleased to announce the selection of Mr. Joe Smith as a new program director for expanded learning. Mr. Smith will be focusing on credit recovery and enrichment for our secondary school students. Mr. Smith has been serving students since 1996 as an academic learning coordinator, social studies teacher, and assistant principal at, at Aptos High. Um, additionally, Mr. Smith has been involved in the basketball programs at Aptos High, coaching both the boys and girls teams and winning several league championships. Mr. Smith holds a BA degree in history from UCSC, a single subject teaching credential from National University, a master's degree in educational administration from San Jose State University, a master's degree in kinesiology from Fresno Pacific, and an administrative credential from San Mateo County Office of Education. We are excited to welcome this highly accomplished educator to his new position. Welcome, Mr. Smith. <laughs> and those are all my announcements and report out of closed session. Great. Our next regular board meeting will be on May 24th, 2023. And with that, we adjourn this meeting at 10.06.